Good evening. I would like to introduce a speaker who has spoken in 48 states and on over 400 college campuses. He's written four books, contributed chapters or essays to 20 books, and is one of several persons featured in White Men Challenging Racism, 35 Personal Stories from Duke University Press. His most recent publication, entitled Between Barack and a Hard Place, Racism and White Denial in the Age of Obama, discusses the implications of President Obama's election on racism in the United States. Our speaker argues that the election of an African American president may not represent the elimination of racism as, as many have come to think. Unfortunately, many Americans have used this event as an excuse to deny the presence of racism and white privilege. In order to confront these issues, we, we must first acknowledge that they exist. I anticipate we will do so this evening. Perhaps the best way for me to introduce our speaker, Tim Wise, is with the words of Georgetown professor and author Eric Dyson, who said, his writing and thinking constitute a bulwark of common sense and uncommon wisdom on the subject of race, politics, and culture. He's a national treasure. Join me now in welcoming author, educator, speaker, and national treasure, Tim Wise. Thank you. I, I really, uh, I should have had my, my phone recording that national treasure piece. My, <laughs> My wife always makes fun of me for that, ever since uh, Michael Eric Dyson said that <clears throat> very kind thing about me several years ago, and she just makes fun of me. She'll call me on the road, yes, is this the national treasure? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you what your daughter did today. <laughs> so it doesn't get me a whole lot of slack in the house, you know, as it probably shouldn't. Thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it. I know that <clears throat> some of you have been at one, if not two already, uh, presentations that I've given. So I feel an intense amount of pressure to not be completely redundant. I got to say something somewhat new. I think I've got some material and, and some additional stuff that was said the first time, but that the rest of you haven't heard. So uh, we'll see if we can make it as lively as possible. Plus, I'm working on about five hours of sleep and very little rest. So this, this should be fun for everyone. Uh, you know, I, I realize before getting really into the substance of, of any presentation. First off, this squeaking is driving me nuts, but it's okay. Um, I'm not going to fall through the stage, I don't guess, so if you hear it, you'll, you'll, I'm, I'm okay. Um, what, I, what I've learned in the 15 years or so that I've been on the road traveling and speaking to, to audiences about the issue of race and racism, and, and in the 20 years um, that I've been doing this work in some capacity at the grassroots level, if not on the road, is that for whatever reason, and there are different reasons for different people, this subject matter is something that for a lot of folks is difficult. It's controversial, even though I don't really think it ought to be. Uh, it ought to be easier than it is, but for a lot of reasons it's not. And because it's difficult for some folks to hear a conversation, an honest conversation around the issue of racism and white privilege and all these topics that I'll be addressing indirectly or directly tonight, I want to start off by telling you a story to sort of ease into it, make it easy, you know, get folks relaxed a little bit. And it's a story that um, I tell it often, so excuse me if you've heard it before, but it's a good one, so you'll like it this time just as much as you did the first time that you heard it. Um, it's, it's a story that has nothing to do with racism, really, at all, and it has nothing to do with issues of racial inequity or white privilege or any of this stuff that's more difficult for some folks to hear about. But it is a story that when I'm done telling it, I think you will acknowledge that it does say something about those subjects, even if that's not the topic of the story itself. It's a story about something that happened to me when I got out of college, which was actually 20 years ago this spring. I graduated in May of 1990 from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And when I got out of school, I decided, for reasons that are still somewhat unclear to me, that I thought it would be a really great idea if I moved into a very large house with nine other people. <laughs> right. I want to give you a little bit of life advice. And uh, if you don't remember another thing I say this evening, that would be a shame because I have more. But if you don't remember anything else, please, for the love of God, remember this one thing. Never should you think to yourself, you know what would be a great idea? <laughs> Moving into a really large house with nine other people. It is not going to be a good idea. It is not going to work out as good as you think it's going to work out. It is not going to be as fun. Doesn't matter how you try to dress it up. We tried to make it political. We called it a co-op. It wasn't a co-op. <laughs> it was just a big nasty house with 10 people living in it. <laughs> but we thought it was great because we thought at least we'll save money. And when you're a broke, just got out of college student, right? Broke means cheap is good. 
So we figured, well, at the very least, we'll save money. We might not even like each other, but we'll do it for a while, maybe a year. We'll save some dough. And definitely on that level, it worked for us because it was only $525 a month. And I don't mean per person. Okay, I mean total, right? <laughs> so now even in 1990, that was good. Like now, they won't even let you sleep on the street for that. Like they would charge you more than that in citations just to sleep on the street. But in 1990, man, that was, I'm not good at math. I don't know how good you are, but like that's a calculation I can do easy in my head. That is $52.50 per person per month. You can't beat that. You take the utility bills, the cable bill. We also split the food, uh, the grocery bill amongst ourselves, right? So you, you sort that out. It's still less than a hundred bucks a pot. Can't beat it. So we thought we had it made. About six weeks into this little experiment in communal living, uh, I came to understand at a visceral level, very personal, intensely personal level, why this had been a horrible idea. Why I would have been better off to just live alone, be broke. Why I would have been better off to just go home and live with my folks. And anything but this horrible mess that I got myself into. And here's how I learned this. I, came, I was working downtown at the time in New Orleans. I was doing work against David Duke, who was a former Klan leader, one of the most prominent overt neo-Nazis in recent American history, and at that time running for United States Senate. So I was, I was involved in the campaign against him. And I've been working downtown all day. I came back uptown, about halfway uptown, which is where we lived in this big house. And I got there at about 6.30. I walked into the house and uh, after getting off the streetcar, and as soon as I walked in, I was hit by this really good, amazingly good smell, right? Not the kind of stuff when you live with 10 people that you normally get assaulted by. But it was wonderful. It was this uh, smell of dinner cooking. And one of the roommates has made dinner for the evening on the left front burner of our stove, right? Uh, which was a big pot of gumbo, because it's New Orleans. And you do that at least once a week, and it was gumbo night. Man, it looked good, and it smelled good, and it even had shrimp in there. It didn't have many, because like I said, we were broke, but it had three of those, three of those little, little bitty-ass shrimp, those really tiny shrimp. <laughs> you know the ones I'm talking about, the shrimp that make like um, popcorn shrimp look like jumbo shrimp. <laughs> the kind that make jumbo shrimp look like lobsters, that, that kind of shrimp, right? It's really not any shrimp. Well, who am I kidding? It's like shrimp dust like some seasoning that you just put in make you think you had seafood gumbo. You did not have seafood gumbo, but when you're broke, you'll, you'll settle for that, right? So I was excited, and when he said, do you want some, I was, I was tempted, but I had to say no because I'd already had dinner downtown. I said, you know what? I'm not hungry, but it smells good. It looks good. I want you to save some of it for me. Uh, you know, put it in some, in some Tupperware or whatever. Put it in the fridge. I'll take it to work tomorrow for lunch because it looks great. He said, cool, I'll do that. I said, fine. So I went upstairs. I hung out with some of the other roommates. I did some work I was behind on, watched some TV or something, went to bed sort of early, woke up the next morning, came downstairs at about 6, uh, about 7.30 actually, uh, to get ready for work, to get some coffee. And I noticed that on the left front burner of that stove was still this pot of gumbo, right? And it's just sitting there, and it's not smelling as good as it had the night before. It's definitely not looking as good as it had the night before. And I was upset for two reasons. One, no portion of it had been saved for me, as I had asked, so the food had gone to waste. And I certainly was not gonna eat it now. And secondly, I was upset because the mess had been left for me, or one of the other nine roommates, I suppose, to you know, clean it up. The guy that made the mess apparently wasn't interested in doing it. So I wasn't real happy with him, but I said, you know what, I've, I've got like 15 minutes before I gotta get on the streetcar and get downtown. I'm just gonna clean it. And then I'll take it up with him when I get home. So I grab the pot of gumbo, I bring it over to the sink. I grab the brush and the gloves and the soap and I'm getting ready to wash this thing. I start to run the water. I got the pot here, I got the water here. And just before I bring the pot under the water, I stop myself and I said, wait, 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 wait. I don't have to clean this. Man, I didn't make this mess. I didn't even eat any of this mess. Now I felt really self-righteous, you know, because I had talked myself out of doing the hard work. So I took the pot of gumbo and I put it right back where I found it, left front burner of the stove, went to work. Came back home that night about 6.15 and I noticed when I got there that one of my other roommates was making dinner for the evening on the right front burner of the stove. <laughs> but on the left front burner was still this pot of gumbo, now a full 24 hours old, getting nastier and crustier on the side of the pot. And I was furious and I looked at my roommate and I said, now hold on, explain to me one thing. How is it that you can make dinner for the evening on the right front burner of our stove for everybody to share when I'm pretty sure you can smell last night's dinner? It's right there, under your left nostril. How could you miss it? And he looked at me and said, without missing a beat, he said, oh, but Tim, I, I wasn't here for dinner last night. I didn't make this gumbo. I didn't have any of this gumbo. Did you eat any of the gumbo, he said? And I said, hey, man, not me. He said, well, neither did I. And now we both felt self-righteous because we knew what our mutual protestations of innocence meant. It meant we didn't have to clean it. We felt good about that. He looked at me and said, would you like some lentils and rice? And I answered, very 
very self-righteously, yes, yes I would. <laughs> I cleaned my plate, I washed it off, I put it in the dish drainer to dry, went upstairs, hung out with the roommates, did some work I was behind on, went to bed somewhat early, woke up that next morning, 7 a.m. I'd forgotten to set an alarm. But now here's a little tip. I don't think I probably have to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. If you are living in a house where a pot of gumbo has been sitting on the left front burner of your stove, having not been cleaned by anybody for 36 and a half hours, least of all the guy that made the mess, trust me when I tell you that you are not going to need an alarm clock to wake you up. Because the smell is going to crawl out of the pot of gumbo on the legs that it has grown overnight. And no English majors, I'm not speaking in metaphor, I mean this literally that the stench is going to grow legs and it is going to grow feet and it is going to crawl up out of the pot. It is going to crawl across your kitchen. It is going to crawl across the living room, up the back stairs, down the back hall, go under your door frame and it is going to find with the precision of a laser that thing on the front of your face you call the nose and you will be awake. And now I was and I was angry because I knew what the smell meant. I knew what was waiting for me on the left front burner of that stove. So I fling open my door angry. I run down the hall. I am angry. I live with nine other people. Cannot find one of them. And the guy that made the gumbo is like Osama bin Laden. Nobody knows where in the hell he might have gone. <laughs> sort of like he made the gumbo as a practical joke and then decided to skip town just to see how long it would take for somebody else to clean it. I get down to the bottom of the stairs. I look across the living room into the kitchen. I see the pot of gumbo, and I'm here to tell you 20 years later, I'm confident to this day that the gumbo saw me. <laughs> and it was at this moment, not a moment earlier, but definitely not a moment later, that I came to understand maybe the most important lesson I had ever learned about anything. Not just gumbo, not just household cleanliness, but life in general. And the lesson was this, it didn't really matter anymore, did it? Whether I was the one that made the mess. Right? It didn't really matter whether I was, as the saying goes, the author of all this unpleasantness. The only thing that mattered was that I was tired of living in that funk. Right? That I was tired of living with that nastiness, with the residue of all that my roommate had done without my approval, without my consent, without my participation, but the legacy of which I was having to deal with right then and there. And the same is true with human society. When we get tired of living in the funk, when we get tired of living with the residue of other folks' actions, in which we had no part, for which we are not to blame, but the legacy of which we inherit to this day, then we will get busy cleaning up that funk, not because we did it, not because we are guilty, but because we're here. And we're the only ones left who are in a position to clean it. There is, and we ought to know this, and if we don't, we should look it up, a profound difference between guilt and responsibility. Okay? Guilt is what you feel for what you've done. Responsibility is what you take because of who you are. If we're not clear about the difference between those things, let us look them up, for they are not, strictly speaking, synonyms, you see. And when we talk about legacy, it's a lot more than just household cleanliness. We reap the inheritance of all that has come before. When we were in third or fourth grade science class, you know, they, they introduced that concept of maybe fifth grade, I don't know, I can't remember, but they introduced that concept of inertia to us, right? This idea that an object in motion will continue in the same general direction unless it's stopped by a force of equal or greater weight and power pushing against it in a different direction. And that's a true statement, but what they didn't tell us at the time, maybe because they didn't know or hadn't thought about it, was because was that inertia is not just a property of the physical universe. Right? That inertia is also a property of the socioeconomic universe and the political universe and the cultural universe. That which happens in one generation affects the next and the next and the next. And it keeps on doing that in exactly the same direction until it is stopped by a force of equal or greater weight pushing against it. When it comes to race, we've inherited an unbelievably tortured legacy. Let's be clear on what that is so we can move forward. When it comes to race, we've inherited a legacy of overt and institutionalized white supremacy. For the first 300 years, going back to the colonial days before we were a nation, go back to the mid-1600s, all the way up to the mid-1900s, a three-century process with maybe, what, 11, 12 generations Involved A 300-year period of formal white supremacy, a 300-year period of institutionalized, formal, and legal white supremacy, a legacy that elevated every single person called white above every single person who wasn't, without a single solitary exception anywhere in the country. That is not an arguable statement. 
There will be other things that I will say this evening with which you are free to disagree. That ain't one of them. That's a matter of historical fact. Now, we don't use that language. I know we don't like to say that. Sounds so horrible. Sounds unpatriotic. Sounds almost un-American to the untrained ear. But the reality is that's what we were, a system of racial fascism. Now, that legacy doesn't go away like a video game gets to start over when you don't like the way it went the first time. You don't get to hit reset, replay, start over, and then erase everything that just went down. That legacy is inherited. We didn't even pretend, really, until 45 or 50 years ago that we were serious about racial equity. I mean, I guess we did pretend, but we weren't very good at it. Not so much that anybody really could look at it and say with any kind of a straight face that we had convinced them that we were about that. So what's the effect of that today? I know some people think, well, that's true, but what is the inertia? What is the holdover consequence? Well, there are a lot of them, but among them, one of the chief things that we see emerging out of that legacy is the fact that today as I speak, not 20 years ago, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago, but right now, tonight, in 2010, the average white family in the United States has 11 times the net worth of the average black family, eight times the net worth of the average Latino family. It isn't because we worked harder. If we've studied our history, we know some of the hardest work ever done on this soil was done by black and brown bodies. They weren't remunerated for it, commensurate with the effort, but they certainly put forth the effort, whether we're talking about enslaved African folks, Latino folks who had half of their nation jacked from them in a war of aggression that we started, make no mistake, whether we're talking about indigenous people whose land had to be jacked, whether we're talking about Chinese Americans who were brought to this country in large part to build the railroads that made the transcontinental economy possible in the first place. We are talking about a legacy of people of color doing some of the hardest work so that well gap is not about merit, it's not about initiative, it's not about work ethic, it's not about white folks having some superior saving strategies, and God knows it's not about white folks possessing some superior investment wisdom about which people of color are lacking. I mean, for the love of God, if we have learned nothing in the last 18 months of global economic meltdown, let us at least take this away, that a handful of rich white men are in fact capable of losing a hell of a lot of money without any help from black people without any help from Mexicans, without any help from people of color, no people of color anywhere near them, just a handful of rich white dudes because of their own incompetence, their own unethical behavior, even in some cases their illegality, able to wipe off trillions of dollars of global wealth from the balance sheets of the world economy. That's what has happened. It was all before Barack Obama moved into the White House, so we can't put it on him either. In the 18 months, the last 18 months of the previous administration, 20% of all the wealth of the United States was eliminated. 20% of all the wealth, the value of all the stuff accumulated over 230 some odd years was wiped out in the last 18 months because of the actions of global economic elites who thought that they could sell and trade derivatives and never worry about those. Do you even know what a derivative is? If you don't, don't worry. Neither do the people who were selling them. <laughs> These are economic instruments that the people who deal them can't explain to you. These are bets on bets. Right? You're going to take a bet on whether that bet is going to come clean. You're going to take a bet on who's going to win that bet. This is all fine if you're like in the basement of your fraternity playing for beer. <laughs> Not so good when you're playing with other people's money in the global economy. Oops, lost it. Sorry. Trillions of dollars, 12 trillion dollars of American wealth wiped out. Wiped out because of the actions of a very narrow elite. Now, I'm not saying it was because they were rich white men that they did it. I'm not, I'm not saying there's something about rich white dudes that makes them venal and corrupt and evil and incompetent and criminal. I'm saying if they'd all been black, that's exactly what somebody would have been saying. People of color can't steal that. I was going to say if they'd been poor, but poor people cannot steal that kind of money. It's impossible. Poor folks can't do half the damage to the economy or to any of us individually that these folks did. Right? It would take like half a millennia for black and brown street thugs to rob you of that much money. They would have to steal around the clock, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never taking a break to eat, use the bathroom, or sleep. Just hand in the pocket, hand in the pocket, hand in the pocket. And after 500 years, they still would not have wiped out $12 trillion? And yet we're still more afraid of the average black or brown young man crossing the street in a hoodie. Then we are a handful of rich white guys driving around in their Lexuses, or maybe the proper term is Lexi. I don't know the plural form, but you get the point. Right? We are still more afraid of the usual suspects, even though the usual suspects cannot do one one hundredth the damage of the not so usual suspects whose actions actually are far more contributory to our current 
situation and the global situation. So that wealth disparity has got nothing to do with merit, talent, intelligence, hard work, or investment strategies. It has to do with the fact that some folks had a head start. And that head start doesn't go away just because you pass the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act. In fact, let's understand the real basis of that head start because this is clearly something some people are confused about right now particularly these folks who keep yelling and screaming about how they don't want the government intervening in the economy. And they don't want the government intervening in health care. And they don't want the government managing. They, they just want the market to control everything. They just want small government. See, that's, that's precious to me. <laughs> Coming from people who never objected to big government when it was creating white wealth, when it was creating the white middle class, make no mistake, that is what did it. Wasn't hard work and initiative in some vacuum, because most people in a competitive society have to work hard or they sink. So that sort of goes without saying. White, black, brown, doesn't matter. People tend to work hard and do so in relatively similar numbers. But what did matter is that the government of the United States stepped in and created wealth for white folks. Big government did that. We need to understand that's where the head start comes from. And this thing goes back an awful long ways. It actually goes back to the colonies in the 1630s and 1640s. There was a program in place. My family actually took advantage of it when one of the branches came during that period. You may or may not have heard about it. Odds are not because we don't talk about it in school. But it was this thing called the Head Right Program. The Head Right Program was a program that allowed male heads of household from England who came to the United States to claim 50 acres of land and the tools with which to work it for nothing. Just for making the trip. Now, you see, you give out 50 acres of land and some tools to black people, and we call that a handout. We call that welfare. We might even call that reparations. You give out 50 acres of land and some tools to white folks, we call it nation building. See how that works? It's fascinating, the different kind of rhetoric that we use. Millions of acres of land were given out that way over a period of a very short period of time. Fast forward to the 1860s. Homestead Act of 1862 gets passed. What does it do? Gives out 240 million or more acres of land for virtually nothing to white families. People of color are almost completely barred from being able to take advantage of it. 240 million acres of virtually free land. That, the free market can't do that. Let's just at least agree on that. The, the small government can't do that. The market cannot take other people's land and give it to you. Right? Only a very large government with guns is capable of doing that. And that's what happened, of course, because this had been somebody else's land before, and then it got taken and redistributed. And yet what's interesting is I haven't seen a single one of the families, because there are 20 million white folks in this country today, some estimate as many as 50 million, but at least 20 million, who are living, who are the direct descendants of those people who got Homestead Act benefits, many millions of them living on that land, living on those ranches, living on those farms, living in those houses. Not one of them has showed up in Washington, D.C. and said, you know what, I've got to give this back, because it uh, seems to me that if I keep this this property that the government made possible, that'd be like, um, what would that be like? What's the word? That'd be like socialism. <laughs> so here, y'all can take this back because I didn't get it fair and square, you see, but no one does that. Fast forward to the 20th century, not even the early 20th, the middle. So we're talking about the lifetimes of people in this room and for others of you, certainly the lifetimes of your parents and grandparents. Right? From the 1930s until the 1960s, the first 30 years of the Federal Housing Administration Home Loan Program, add to that the VA Home Loan Program, added to that in the 1940s. What were these? These were government-created programs to subsidize indirectly by way of guaranteeing with taxpayer dollars private loans from banks. Prior to the creation of the FHA, banks would not lend money to working class people. didn't matter what color you were. They just didn't want to do it because the risk was too great. So even if you were white, it didn't matter. If you didn't have enough to pay like half the down payment of front and you could pay it off in 10 years, you weren't getting a mortgage. That was the way it was. The government steps, so there was no middle class. I mean, there just wasn't any. The government steps in, creates the FHA program, later the VA program. What do these do? They basically say, don't worry if the borrowers default, right, it'll be backed up by the full faith and credit of the United States Treasury, which is to say the taxpayers of the United States. So you'll get your money back or at least some portion of it. And that made the banks willing to lend to lower income and working class white families who previously would have had to rent just like black and brown families that wouldn't have been able to buy. But the problem was the FHA, which now is like a universal, a lot of you when you get your first home will probably get an FHA loan. That's what you do. It's low interest, the terms are good, you know, you don't have to have a lot down, that kind of thing. But in the first 30 years of that program, it was almost exclusively for whites. Because the underwriting criteria that the banks were using that was actually given to them by a quasi-public institution, right, known as the Home Ownership Lending Corporation, which was created during this period, the underwriting criteria that they used basically made it impossible for people of color to get these loans, even though they were guaranteed with taxpayer money, including the money of black and brown taxpayers. But the way the criteria was written, 98% of all the loans went to white families. By 1960, 40% of all white family mortgages were being written under this one preferential policy. 
government policy, $120 billion worth of housing equity loaned from the early 1940s, late 30s, until the early 1960s at a time when people of color couldn't get in on that. $120 billion head start. And again, if you do that for people of color, that's affirmative action, that's racial preference, that's welfare, that's a handout. You do it for white folks, it's good macroeconomic policy. Right? And of course, it was good macroeconomic policy. It would have been even better had it been extended to people of color, because you'd have had an even bigger economic stimulus. But they weren't thinking in those terms. So you have the FHA, the VA program, even black and brown veterans excluded from the loans that were available under the VA program. You have the GI Bill, which in theory was available to all returning veterans after World War II in Korea. But in practice, the disproportionate benefits went to white veterans, because if you were a veteran of color, the employers because you know, theoretically what the GI Bill did, said, it said you could get training uh, you know, to have a job, you could go to college, you know, you'd get these opportunities, but the employers still had the right of refusal. They still had the right to not hire you, to discriminate against you on the basis of race. Their property rights as owners were given precedence over the right of those returning GIs to have jobs. You couldn't just go to any college if they didn't want to admit you, so people of color were still excluded even after they had served the country in the military. So you had all of these programs, Homestead Act, VA, FHA, GI Bill, go all the way back to the head right system, all these things pumping literally hundreds of billions, one might say trillions of dollars worth of wealth into white folks' hands before people of color even got to the starting gate of wealth accumulation by the time the Fair Housing Act came around. And if you know anything about the Fair Housing Act, which wasn't even passed until 1968, you know that for the first 20 years, neither Democrats or Republicans thought it was important to put enforcement mechanisms in. So there weren't even any enforcement mechanisms until 88, right? I mean, so 20 years, it's, it's on the books, but it doesn't mean anything. And even now, we know that there's evidence of discrimination. I'll speak to that in a second. But the point here being, that's why I find it so interesting when those folks in the Tea Parties and all this stuff that are angry about healthcare talk about they want their country back the way it used to be when government was small. What date was that? Because government was never small for white people. Never was it small. Taxes were not lower back in the day. How taxes were, top tax rate in 1958 was 91%. Right? It's less than half that now. Whether you think it should be even lower, let's not pretend that we want to go back to the way it was when taxes were low. Taxes were higher, government was just as big, and white folks didn't mind it when we were the only ones getting benefits. It's only when people of color started to gain access to other programs, which aren't even as generous as the ones we had access to, that all of a sudden we discovered our inner libertarian. Right? All of a sudden, we discovered our inner love of the free market. We didn't care about that before. Right? When the New Deal was passed, people of color were excluded from almost all the programs. Social Security, for the first 20 years, basically excluded 8 out of 10 black folk because it said you couldn't get in on Social Security if you were an agricultural laborer or a domestic worker, which was like 3 quarters, 80% of all black folks in the country. And that was done at the behest of Southern Democrats who made FDR work that into the New Deal legislation in order for them to vote for it. They just want to make sure black folks couldn't get in on the government programs. They didn't mind government programs. They just didn't want people of color getting in on it. Right? So that's the history of how wealth was created and not. That's the legacy that we have inherited. But of course, if it were just about the past, maybe we could just teach that in a history class and be done. You know, if it was just, even the, the legacy part, we could say, yeah, you know, you're right, but gosh, I mean, at least now we're over it. You know, at least now we've moved on. So yeah, we got to deal with all that residue, but at least now we don't have anything contributing more to inequality, new stuff, but of course we do. None of what I just said, for example, changed on the 5th of November of 2008, the day after the presidential election. Right? None of it changed on the 21st of January 2009 just because a man of color was elected president. Yet a lot of people think that's true. The Wall Street Journal, the day after the election, said we're a post-racial nation and Obama should let everybody know that. Of course, the Wall Street Journal has never thought we had a race problem in this country. Never once did they editorialize about it, even when it was blatant. So you can take whatever they say with a grain of salt on pretty much any subject. Right? Um, but they also thought derivatives were great and would work out just fine. So I wouldn't really count on them for much. Right? But it wasn't just conservatives. That's easy, right? It was also some liberal folks. It was Richard Cohen, a nominally liberal columnist with the Washington Post. Frank Rich, a nominally liberal columnist with the New York Times, both of which wrote similar articles in the week leading up to the election or Cohen on the day of the election, but the votes hadn't even been counted yet. See, I've learned... You, know, you don't assume you know who won the presidency for like three months. If you're smart, you have to stick around and wait because you just never know how things are going to shake out. But Richard Cohen was so confident on the day of the election that he said, we have overcome. Right? 
fascinating. You actually jack civil rights language, right? And we have, uh, like, like as if that was part of the civil rights agenda, getting a black president. That wasn't even on the top 100 things that the movement was fighting for. It wasn't even in the, in the rear view mirror of that. I mean, it wasn't even on the agenda. But a lot of people seem to think that the election of a man of color as president somehow suggests that we're post-racial. Before we get into the specifics of why this is so crazy and so flawed, I just want you to think about it logically for a minute. You know, that is important, and I'm going to give you some that I think demonstrate the fallacy of it. But let's just think about it logically. Why would we think that individual accomplishment, even at that level, signifies larger systemic change. Because that's what people say. How can we be a racist country anymore if a man of color can be elected president? I don't know. How did Benazir Bhutto win in Pakistan? Is it because sexism is dead? <laughs> right? A woman. She won not once but twice, 88 and 91. Now, she can't try to come back into politics, and they killed her. That's how much they loved her. Right? Assassinated as she tries to return to the political field, but elected twice as a female. If I were to say that Pakistan no longer had an issue with sexism, that patriarchal oppression had been you know, just eliminated in Pakistan. And this I know because Benazir Bhutto, a female, was head of state over 20 years ago, as a matter of fact. Most people, I think, would hear that and go, come on. Like, we know that girls and women in Pakistan don't have fully equal opportunity. Same thing in India, Israel, Great Britain. They've all had female heads of state. But I don't think that anyone is going to say about any of those places that girls and women in those places are not discriminated against anymore. And yet, really, that is what we're being asked to accept in the case of our own country with regard to the subject of race. That somehow individual accomplishment says there's no longer a problem. By which logic, we should say also there was no racism in 1911 in this country or at least none that really was a barrier to black people. And this we know because that was the year that Madam C.J. Walker became a millionaire, the first African-American and first female millionaire in this country's history. Right? She became a millionaire, for those who know the story, manufacturing and marketing, distributing, developing beauty products for black women. Cosmetics, at a time when white-dominated cosmetics firms didn't see the need to do this or even care about the black market. So Madam C.J. Walker moves into this opening, right, and she creates this business, and she becomes a millionaire. Fantastic. But would anyone have said, well, Madam C.J. Walker can make it, so what the hell's wrong with all the rest of you black people? In 1911, I mean, I guess somebody could have said that, but surely we would understand how silly that was. Right? Surely we would understand that individual accomplishment, even at a level like that, doesn't necessarily tell you anything about larger systemic change. So what's the evidence? Well, the evidence is, and this is from the Labor Department just last December, that black college graduates, just to give you an idea of the ongoing disparity, and then we'll talk about the causes for that, that black college graduates twice as likely to be unemployed as white college graduates. Latino college graduates, two-thirds more likely to be unemployed than white college graduates. Asian Pacific American college graduates, 15% more likely to be out of work than their white counterparts. And when people of color are out of work, they also, regardless of their educational accomplishment, are out of work for longer periods, whether you're Asian American or African American, for example, on average seven to nine additional weeks out of work relative to white folks. So that's important for a couple reasons. One, it indicates that even when people of color have got similar educational qualifications, they are, they are not having the same outcome and the same ultimate opportunities, it also goes a long way toward debunking this notion of reverse discrimination and unfair preference for people of color. Because if that were a real problem, they'd be snapping up all these folks of color. Oh my God, a black person with a college degree, gotta hire them. Latino with a college degree, gotta hire them. Asian with a college degree, gotta hire them. This and lack of opportunity for white people. But of course, that's not what's going on. We know a study from a few years ago confirmed that MIT and the University of Chicago. Study comes out from their econ departments. If you don't know anything about their econ departments, trust me when I tell you they are hardly leftist in orientation, the University of Chicago in particular, right? And this study comes out which finds that job applicants with white sounding names 50% more likely to get called back for an interview than applicants with black sounding names even when the qualifications are the same. Same years of experience. Right? Same kind of education at the very same quality schools. Everything indistinguishable except the names at the top. And simply being suspected of whiteness gives you a leg up. That too d demonstrates ongoing bar barriers for, in this case, black folks, ongoing advantages for white folks. In fact, the study found that for a black applicant to have the same odds of getting a call back for an interview, not even guarantee the job, just an interview itself. For a black person to have the same odds of a callback for an interview, they would have to have eight more years of experience relative to a white applicant in order to have the same odds. You had to be considerably more qualified to just have the same chance of getting your foot in the door. That's a study that comes out in 04. It's important to point that out because 2004 is also the year that Barack Obama is introduced to most of us at the Democratic National Convention, right? John Kerry's nominating convention, summer, uh, convention, summer of 04 in Boston. 
And most of us had never heard of the man before. He stands up, he's a state senator at the time, running for US senator, an office he would win that November. Stands up the summer of 2004 and gives this beautiful oratory, right? First time most of us had seen him, first national speech. And in that, in that, in that speech, he had a lot of applause lines. The one that got the biggest reaction was the one where he said, and you may remember it, if not, go back and listen to it, it's stunning. He goes, we're not a black America and a white America and a Latino America and an Asian America. We're just the United States of America. And everybody's like, oh. Oh, because <laughs> yeah. it was lovely, man. It was beautiful. It was it was poetic. It was prosaic. It was inspiring. It was absolutely and utterly inaccurate. And Barack Obama, smart enough to know that it was, I don't have any doubt that he knew even as he said it that he was saying something that was intellectually completely devoid of all substance. But it was a great applause line. It made everybody feel good. That, he said that the same summer that this MIT and University of Chicago study came out about the white names and the black names, which tells us what? That we're not united at all. That our opportunities are not equal at all. The same summer, a Justice Department report comes out that says that black and Latino males two to three times more likely than white males to be stopped and searched for drugs by cops, even though white males are four times more likely to have the drugs on us on the occasions when we are searched. So we're half as likely, maybe one third as likely, to be searched, but we're four times more likely to be guilty on the occasions when we are. That is heavy information. And it certainly suggests we're not a united nation. It suggests that, in fact, we are profoundly dis, you know, dis, that's not even a word, disunified. I'm now I'm reverting back to old presidential ways, but, but <laughs> it's making up words. But that's the beauty of whiteness. See, I can do that. I can say disunified, and tomorrow it'll be in somebody's dictionary, right? Because as a white person, I can just make up language, and folks will go, that's okay. It's okay. Black person says disunified, folks are going to be like, that's not a word, or whatever word I want to make up, right? That's just the beauty of privilege. I'm just, that's a little side note. But in any event, right, in any event, unity is not something that you have just because you say it. It's not an act of wish fulfillment. It's not like that movie with Kevin Costner, right, where he builds the baseball stadium in the back of his yard, and, he, and all those old dead white dudes come back to play, right? And he's like, if you build it, they will come. And it's like magic, right? That's not how justice happens. That's not how equity happens. It's not how unity happens. You don't just say it and then it emerges. You have to actually work at it. And we haven't finished that work. That's what the evidence says. Two to four million, depending on which number you believe. But let's just take the bottom one, the most conservative estimate. Two million cases of race-based housing discrimination against people of color every year. Folks being given mortgages at higher interest rates than they would be if they were white with the same collateral, same credit record, same occupational status, income, et cetera. This ends up depriving hundreds of thousands of black and brown folks every single year, if not millions of, really it would be millions, of black folks every year. Um, equity that they would otherwise amass. If you think about uh, a point, point and a half, two points on a loan, which is oftentimes what people of color are being charged above what they would if they were white, right, in terms of their interest rate, over a 30-year loan period, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars in additional payments to the bank. That's a couple hundred thousand dollars less equity that you're able to develop. Think about the effect of that, not just on those families, which is obvious, right, for them to have less wealth, but it's also an effect on the overall economy because that's less money that I can, what do people do with their housing equity, right? Housing equity is really the number one way that most of our parents pay for our college, Right? In addition to whatever financial aid we're able to get, debt we're willing to go into, scholarships we're, we're lucky enough to get, the number one way that parents pay for their kids' education is to dip in to their housing equity. The way that we start businesses is often by dipping in to our housing equity. So if you've got millions of families and households of color around the country with you know, collectively tens of billions of dollars in less equity because they've been treated differentially in the housing market, that's money they can't use to pay for their kids' education. That's money that they can't use to start their own business, which would help stimulate the economy of whatever neighborhood and community they're living in. Really, the whole economy, the whole national economy. So we're talking about a, an economic effect, what, what economists call a, a multiplier effect, that goes well beyond just the community that's being ripped off, if you will, and given less opportunity. This is stuff we need to think about, and not just people of color. It's obvious why people of color have to because your lives and opportunities are at stake. But I want to let, make sure everybody in the room that's white also understand that this matters or should matter to you. Because the truth of the matter is, whether or not you think it's about you, maybe it's not right now. A lot of folks didn't think the subprime mortgage thing was a problem either for them when it was only black and brown folks being hit by it. And then it spread. Didn't think double digit unemployment for black and brown folks was a national crisis when that was happening 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 10 years ago, even when the economy was good. And now that white folks are looking at double digit unemployment, it's like the, the sky is falling, the world is ending. But for some people, that's not new. 
right? For some people, that's been a normal condition. So we, A, we need to pay attention because you never know when the stuff that's hitting this group over here today is going to come back and hit you. But B, it's also important, or maybe that's two. I don't know whether I said one or A. I'm, it's been a long day. But the second point, regardless of whether it's a B or a two, is right, that ultimately in about 30, 35, 40 years, take your pick, doesn't matter, say 50, long shot, 50 years, about half the people in our country are going to be folks of color, and about half are going to be white. That's a fact. You don't have to like it. It doesn't much matter. That's what's going to be. It's already the case in California and Texas and I believe Arizona. It's going to be a national reality in about 40 to 50 years. Half the country, folks of color, half white. There is no way on earth that anyone in their right mind can believe that we can sustain a healthy economy, that we can sustain a healthy political system, that we can sustain a healthy society at any level where half of that society is twice as likely to be unemployed as the other half where half of that society is three times as likely to be poor as the other half, where half of that society has one-tenth the wealth on average of the other half, where half of that society has double the infant mortality rates of the other half, where half of that society has nine years less life expectancy than the other half, where half of that society is substantially more likely to not finish school, not go on to college, or end up in prison than the other half. You cannot sustain a society that way. If Lincoln said that we couldn't last as a nation divided against itself, Right, and that was talking about something that was awfully big issue at that time. Trust me when I tell you this is just as big an issue in the sense that we will rise or fall together. So even those of us who are not the immediate targets of racial inequity pay the cost down the line for that racial inequity, increasingly so when the people being targeted by that and affected by it are an increasing percentage of the population. Right? That makes it especially pressing as a concern, or it should for all of us. So individual success tells us very little about systemic change. And especially when you consider what the president had to do in order to even win in the first place, right? which is what? First and foremost, he had to say absolutely none of what I've said tonight. None of it. Not because he doesn't know it. He, he knows all of this. I don't have any doubt that he knows everything I've said. But I also have no doubt that had he said one-tenth of what I've said, he wouldn't be the president of the United States. And he knows that too. He couldn't have even said the easy stuff. See, it's one thing for him to like get up and talk about ongoing racism. I can imagine that would seem to be difficult for him. But he couldn't even get up and say the historical stuff the way I said it. He gave that race speech you know, here in Philadelphia, and he talked about some of it. He talked about that FHA program, as a matter of fact. So he, he sort of walked up to the line of what I said. But now he didn't use the language I used. Did he? he didn't say, we were a nation of systematized white supremacy. Even, I mean, are you kidding? But that's not even arguable. It's like I said, that's like saying this is a microphone. Man, it's just true, right? That's an iPhone. It just is an iPhone. That's it. Like, there's no other interpretation. But he couldn't have gotten up in that speech here in Philadelphia and said, you do realize that we were, for a very long time, a society of institutionalized white supremacy. He couldn't have even said that if only for the purpose of saying how much progress we've made. He couldn't have even said that even if he followed it with, and thank God those days are over because people would have got stuck on the fact that he told the truth. White supremacy? My God, you hate America. Which makes sense because you're not even from here. <laughs> Which, by the way, we just, I'm just deal with that. I mean, I shouldn't even waste my time, but... Sometimes constructive ridicule is helpful when we have these conversations. <laughs> Anyone who thinks that this man was not born in the United States is, is insane, is insane. And, and, and that right now is 45% of the Republican Party, according to a Harris poll last week. I'm not trying to be mean now. If it's not you, don't take it personally. But 45% of the Republican Party said that he's not born in America. One out of four said he's the Antichrist, so. Eh. <laughs> if you think this man wasn't born in America, then you have to explain one thing to me very simply. Other than the documentation, which the Republican governor of Hawaii has said is very clear and they've uh, distributed. You have to explain to me how his mother knew. Because right? his mama put a birth announcement in the Honolulu paper 10 days after he was born. Now that is some foresight right there. If he wasn't really born in Honolulu, if he was really born in Kenya, like these folks at these rallies that go back to Kenya and show us the birth certificate, and like his mom, just imagine what this means. Like his mom is sitting over there in Mombasa and she's like, oh man, look at that little four day old child. My God, it's amazing. He is going to be president of the United States. I know that in a lot of states back in, back in the state, he can't even vote right now, but he will be president one day, so I better get a message to Honolulu somehow. But we gotta, <laughs> we gotta plant this. We gotta, because he's gonna, and they're gonna ask. 
So I got to send a fact. No, there's no facts. Um, <laughs> I got to send an email. No, there's no. I got to put a message on a boat and send it to Hawaii to let them know, plant this so that my boy can grow up to be president. That is, that's insane. No, no offense, no offense, frankly, to the mentally ill, but that is the kind of thing that almost necessitates forced medication. And, and yet that's what folks are saying, right? So we gotta understand there's this blatant stuff. This president couldn't talk about any of it. This president wouldn't be able to even say the easy stuff. Even with the smile on his face, it wouldn't matter because what does the data say? And this is important about this election. According to survey data, six out of 10 white Americans are willing to admit we continue to hold racist views about black people. That's the ones willing to admit it in polls. And you know, a lot of folks won't admit what they think because they know it sounds bad. That, at least we've made that much progress. 50 years ago, white folks didn't feel the need to front. They would just say, yep, don't like black people. What of it? Now, we have at least enough progress to where we feel like we have to um, sort of put on this appearance, which I mean, it is progress in a way, but it also makes it hard, right, to really know what's going on underneath the surface. So six out of 10 white folks are willing to just go on record as saying, yep, I hold on to at least one stereotypical racist view about black folks. If you look at some of the other research that's been done, 85% or more of white folks who have been tested for what they call implicit biases or subconscious racial biases have demonstrated that they had them. So it's not everyone, but it's pretty close. Other studies have taken white folks in focus groups, hooked them up to MRI machines and brain scanners, and then shown them a, a video a clip on a computer screen of a black male face for 30 milliseconds. It's not even long enough to, for the conscious mind to process it when it goes that fast. It's a subliminal image. And when they do it, then they show what the brain does and the parts of the brain that light up in that moment, but don't light up when you show other images. Only the black male face, when you show that image, the part of the brain that lights up in the MRI or whatever it's called that, that they do the brain scans with is, uh, is the part that responds to fear, anxiety, and stress. So that, and that's 90 to 95% of whites that respond that way. So what it means is the overwhelming majority of white folks have, by our own admission or by the evidence that comes out in these studies, have these internalized biases against black folks. Now, by definition, some of those folks voted for Barack Obama. They had to. Got 43% of the white votes. Some of those folks had to be among the 60 or the 85 or the 90 or the 95% of white folks who continue to hold these biases. So what does it mean? It means that in some sense, what a lot of white folks were saying is, we don't like most of them, but now that one's okay. Which means, and I do not mean any disrespect to the president when I say this, in some regard, he was turned into the Cliff Huxtable of American politics. Right? A black guy that white folks can relate to. Oh, I like him so much. He's so cool. I like, he's so different than the rest of you. He's so wonderful. I'd love to have him as a neighbor. He's great. <laughs> Which is what white folks said about the Huxtables during the Cosby show. Forgetting for a moment they were a fictional TV family. God, I'd love the Huxtables to come over for dinner. They're not common. They're actors. Right? Right? But so, and that, so that's not the end of racism. That's the shape-shifting of racism from 1.0 to 2.0, right? 1.0 is like old school. We know that when we see it, it's real easy to call out. 2.0 is like, it's like the shape-shifting, the morphing, right, where you still hold on to some negative views about the larger community. But yeah, you'll carve out some exceptions for this person or that person, maybe a couple friends of color and stuff, because you view them as fundamentally different. But if that's the case, you still view the larger community negatively which is still a form of racism, right? So that's what we have to deal with right now in the president. What does that mean for people of color? Like a lot of people, I remember after the election, they said, well, now it's gonna be easier for other black and brown folks because they have this individual they can point to and they can see that they, you know, they can be anything they want. And on the one hand, look, I don't wanna underestimate the value of that imagery and the symbolism, but let's really break that down and think seriously about the pressure that now people of color are under. Right? Pressure that's even greater than it's always, always been great. But now you have the pressure of living up to that model See, white folks, we don't have what they call an archetype of acceptable whiteness. Archetype, different from a stereotype, right? A stereotype is a negative sounding thing, and we know what those are. Archetype, if you look it up, it's an ideal or model type. Almost sounds positive, right? You're the ideal fill in the blank. You're the model fill in the blank. For people of color, now we got this new archetype of black masculinity in the White House. And that's a legitimate version of black masculinity, but it can't be the only one. And the fear that I think a lot of folks have right now is like, what if they don't live up to that standard? See, we as white folks don't have to worry about that. There is no standard of acceptable whiteness. We can be really articulate or the opposite of that and still become president of the United States. We can, and I don't mean any disrespect by saying that. I mean, even the last president would admit that. He had a good sense of humor. But one of the things I liked about the guy, right, was that he had a sense of humor about his own inability to articulate the language. Like, he would joke about that. He made fun of it just as much as others did. But that was okay because folks didn't, white folks didn't look at him every time he mispronounced the word and go, damn, come on. <laughs> Man, hold it down. You are messing it up for all of us. 
But now, if Barack Obama on the campaign trail had done one-tenth the malapropism of George W. Bush, mistaking words, basic words of the language, making up words that don't exist, that would have been it, and people of color would have been throwing stuff at the screen. Damn! Why? Why? You know, because that's the difference. So for people of color, and it's not just black folks that have to deal with this, Asian American folk, they're archetypes of acceptable Asian-ness. Right? Oh yeah, as long as you're Asian Pacific Island or Asian American and good at science and math and that's what you're all about, yeah, we know what to make of that. We know where to, where to slot you in. We understand that. But what if you're the Asian American that doesn't like science or math or isn't good at them or wants to be a social worker or a kindergarten teacher or a poet or an actor, right? Or a cabinet maker or whatever. And you don't fit within that mold. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to college. Actually, I can. Five or six, one or the other and met Asian American women who are professors of like English literature at their school. And you know, they, they teach that because they have a PhD in it. That's how that works. But every time they talk about going in for their first day of class and there are white students who show up and they look at them and it's like, they're checking their syllabus. They're, I mean, they're checking their schedule. Like, am I in the right room? Um, are you Miss? Whatever, whatever. Are, am I in the wrong? Are you filling in for the teacher? Like they say this stuff because there's an extent to which we don't like that. How can you be Asian American and be a teacher of English literature? Well, because that's your area of specialization and study and academic credential. But if that were a calculus class, nobody would question it. Right? If it were a computer science class or some advanced you know, science class, nobody would question it because it would fit. So we've got to understand the burden of what that means on a campus. Right? It means that you have some of your colleagues and, and, and your peers who are experiencing a very different kind of pressure. We all have pressure. I remember college very well, and I was not a very good student. And I know there's pressure to perform and to succeed and to do well and to get good grades and to get out of here and all that. And I know that's stressful for everyone. People of color got all that same stress, and they got this one other thing which is to hold it down for the group because they know if they drop the ball, there's at least somebody that may look at that as a group drop, right? In other words, if that somehow reflects on the whole group when you're in a classroom and race comes up and all eyes literally or figuratively seem to turn to people of color. Like black folks, like black folks had a convention last week <laughs> where they said in committee, now look y'all, if the white folks want to know about this, this is going to be our position for the next foreseeable future. We might change, so get back to us. But this is our line. Or like Asian American or Latina folks had like an email tree that went out. Now this is our position. Don't mess it up. Right? Didn't happen. But that again, for white folks, that's not our burden. We don't ever have to represent for white people. If I drop the ball, if I don't answer a question correctly in class, I know that no one's going to think it's because I'm white. If I don't do well on a standardized test, either to get into this place or to get into a graduate school, law school, medical school, I know that no one is going to ascribe that to my racial identity in some group flaw. People of color can't take that for granted. People of color can't even take for granted that people are going to realize they deserve to belong here in the first place. Right? Because the assumption is, oh, you're only here because they lowered standards for you. That's sort of funny, considering that, according to a study by the Century Foundation in 2007, there are twice as many white folks in our selective colleges who got in, even though they had lower scores and lower grades than the average, than there are people of color who got any help from affirmative action. And the reason those white folks got help was because they had good family connections. Somebody made a phone call, made a donation, was an alum at the campus. Right? So you have twice as many white folks with quote unquote less qualifications taking slots in college, and yet we have white students getting angry at black and brown students. Uh, you took my slot. First off, until you have the slot, it ain't yours. Right? <laughs> secondly, secondly, getting angry at people of color for quote unquote taking white slots is like when it's two times as many white folks bumping other white folks and people of color out, even though they had less quality. That's like driving around looking for a place to park on your campus, not finding one, and getting pissed off at disabled parking. <laughs> and don't act like you haven't done it. Because we've all done it. We're driving around on the campus or at the mall and we're like, Ugh, look at that, there's five disabled parking slots in there. Isn't even anybody parked in them. If it wasn't for those set aside spots, I'd be parked. No fool, if you got up an hour earlier, you'd be parked. Or, or if your school didn't give out more parking passes than they have spots for, you'd be parked right now. It's an issue of scarcity. It's not an issue of distribution, right? And if I was only black, I'd have gotten into Harvard. Okay, but here's the deal. You don't get to just be black on the day that you apply to Harvard. You gotta be black for 18 years before that ever happens. You gotta deal with 18 years of being black before you get the one goodie that you think you're gonna get, which is apply to a school where only 3% of the applicants even get in, right? And if the average white family in America were 
to switch places with the average African American family, they would have approximately $100,000 less wealth. So have at it, you know. But I have a feeling that most white folks wouldn't really want to switch places economically for all the goodies that they believe they get. But see, we just don't talk about this. We're just afraid to talk about it. And white folks, you know, even really good, caring, compassionate white folks, I think that's most people. I think most white folks, most black folks, most all folks are good people. I could be wrong, but I fundamentally believe that's true, and yet even good people can miss it and always have. See, it's one thing to deny racism now. Go back to the early 60s. This is an easy call. If I ask you, do, did black people have equal opportunity in 1962, 1963, you're all going to say no. We all know that, right? That was before the civil rights laws were even passed that, that, we, that we now look back at as givens and take for granted. But in 1963, when the Gallup organization asked white America, do you believe that black folks are treated equally in housing, education, and employment in your community, two out of three white folks even then said yes. Right? Two, think about that, 1963, that's the year of the March on Washington, height of the civil rights movement, I have a dream speech. So what that means is two out of three white folks didn't think there was anything to be marching for. Right? So the thing comes on, Walter Cronkite comes on the air, shows the clip of the I Have a Dream speech in the nightly news and shows it, and two out of three white people by our own admission are looking at the screen going, I don't get it. Why are, why are these black people angry? Why, why are they marching? I'm so confused. I, I think everything's just fine in America right now. Honey, please turn on Leave it to Beaver so I don't have to deal with this. <laughs> A year earlier, in 1962, Gallup asked white folks, do you think black children have equal educational opportunity? Easy call in 62, right? The answer is no. We all know that in retrospect. But in 1962, when the past wasn't the past, when it was the present, 87% of white folks said yes. Black children have fully equal schooling opportunity. Almost 9 out of 10 white folks just completely clueless. Now, is that because they were uncaring, unfeeling, cold-hearted, mean, nasty, bigoted, venal, racist people? No. Are there people like that in every group? Yes. Is that an explanation for why almost nine out of 10 white people don't have a clue? No. What is the explanation? It's real simple. And it's the same explanation that would explain why most white folks in 2010 don't get it. It's because we don't have to. In 1962, 63, did white folks have to know what people of color were experiencing? No. I would say in 2010, you still don't have to know. You can remain oblivious to it and nothing happens to you because it's not gonna be on the test and by that, I mean, the test you've got to take to get into college, to get out of college, to get into grad school, law school, med school, be a social worker, get any kind of professional certification. There's not a single test in this country that you're going to have to pass in order to be considered competent for something, where you're going to have to demonstrate even a fleeting familiarity with the experience of millions of your fellow countrymen and women. Now, if people of color, on the other hand, don't learn what white folks think is important knowledge, what happens? See? All hell breaks loose because that will be on the test. In fact, that will be the whole test, what the dominant group has deemed important. That's why people of color will have to learn white literature and white theater and white poetry and white art. And yes, I realize we don't call it that. That's sort of the point. Right? When your stuff is the norm, when your stuff is the stuff against which everybody else's stuff gets compared, you don't have to racially designate the origin. You don't have to call it white literature. You just get to call it literature. <laughs> Theater, <laughs> poetry, <laughs> art. <laughs> this, for those who were confused, we got like 11 months, so let's clear it up before February comes back. This is why we don't have White History Month. <laughs> I just want to be clear, because I don't want to hear it again in 11 months. This is why we don't have it, because we have several. They just happen to go by these tricky sabotage kind of camouflage kind of names that we've given them like May and June and July and August and all these other months right where if we haven't designated it for somebody else you can bet that's going to be ours and we're even going to learn about white folks in February truth be told so we don't even really give that one over entirely right that's the point when you're the dominant group you don't have to know any of that and even if you're a really good caring compassionate person you can remain oblivious it's not just with race that that's true it's true with every identity for men we don't have to know what women experience in terms of sexism do we i mean if we do know it's probably because a woman told us and we chose to believe her instead of thinking she was overwrought or over emotional or god forbid hormonal <laughs> just in case you didn't know i learned this recently apparently only women have hormones <laughs> Testosterone? No, it does nothing to men. But estrogen? Oh, that will drive you to the brink of insanity when you're a woman. Right? So men don't have to know any better. Straight folks don't have to know what LGBT folks experience. If we do, it's probably because someone in our life, a friend, a family member, a colleague, you know, who is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, told us and we chose to believe them, to believe that maybe they know their life better than we do. Shocking, radical kind of thought. 
Or even more basic, let's say at the most basic level to understand what I mean by the privilege of obliviousness. Think about like able-bodied and disabled. I don't even know how I got into this room tonight. And it's not because I have particularly bad short-term memory. I mean, I do have these two little children and they do suck my brain matter badly. You know, I forget a lot of stuff. But I got a good enough short-term memory. It's not that. It's that I didn't really have to pay attention to how I got in here. I don't remember if there were steps. And now that I'm thinking about it, there, there weren't, I don't think. But, but I didn't have to think about that because as an able-bodied person, and let's be honest, we're all only temporarily so. If we live long enough, we'll all probably have some kind of disability or infirmity. But, but as a temporarily able-bodied person, I had the luxury of not knowing what people with disabilities face in terms of the obstacles, discrimination, mistreatment, barriers to access. I don't have to give thought to like, how long am I going to take to get from this place to this place? If there's a fire, God forbid, how do I get out? These are not things I have to sweat. And the fact that I don't think about them, that doesn't make me a bad person doesn't make me intentionally oppressive to the disabled, right? It just means that I have the luxury of having one less thing to think about that gives me a leg up in just about any situation or any setting because I have one less thing to think about in a hyper-competitive society environment. And if we want to know if disabled folks face obstacles, who are you going to ask? Me? I just told you, I don't even know. I didn't even pay attention to how I got in. If you want to know if disability is an issue for folks who have it, you need to ask them. And then when they tell you, believe them and don't think they're insane. Same thing is true with gender, with class, with sexuality, and with race. If you want to know if people of color are the targets of discrimination, you might want to talk to them and then believe them when they say their answer, which will so often be yes. Right? As opposed to thinking that they're exaggerating or playing a race card. If we learn nothing else, it's at least learn this. Race is not a card. Okay? And if it is, it's like the two of diamonds. Okay? And if you all play cards, you know that will not win any hand you've got. Right? It is not a winning hand. It's not like people of color find themselves in an argument with white folks and they're like, damn, I'm losing. I'm losing. What am I going to do? I got it. I got it. The race car. And the research. And I think that's important. But I also think it's important to know that we don't just deny that stuff sometimes. We deny that this is an internal issue for us personally. And until we understand that it's a personal thing that affects every single one of us, we're not going to make a lot of progress, that we've all been conditioned to have certain reactions. When I talk about 60 or 80 or 90, 95, whatever percent you want to choose of white folks who have these internalized biases, I think really to all, all of us do to some extent, just like I think all men do to some extent, not, not all the same, differing degrees, but we've all internalized. That's what marketing is. That's why marketers and, and advertisers spend billions of dollars to sell us products because they know it works. Right? There's this thing called the rule of 11 in advertising. When you have somebody see an advertisement like the 11th time or after, that's when they decide they need the product. The first 10 times, it doesn't get through. But the 11th time is like, Charmin. Gotta have Charmin. Not Angel Soft. Not Cottonelle. I will chafe for weeks if I go with that brand. I gotta have Charmin. Right? If you can convince somebody about a product with 11 ads, imagine how much easier it is to convince people about racial and gender in a, a, a superiority and inferiority, class superiority and inferiority, when you've got years to do that. And it comes from the home, and it comes from the schools, and it comes from the religious institutions, and it comes from the media. I mean, it's nonstop. So it's really no shock that we would all fall prey to it to an extent. Now, we don't have to feel guilty about that. Again, like I said at the outset, guilt and responsibility, not the same. But if we inherit that conditioning and legacy, we have to own it. And when we do own it, there is some good news. When we own it, we can get hold of it. Let me give you an example of what I mean. And this is, this is one of those things, like I used to be real cynical about the prospects for, for awareness being sufficient. People would say, well, yes, awareness is nice, but what does that lead to? Actually, actually, there is some evidence, and it's been around a long time, that awareness of our own internalized crap and just owning that and taking hold of it and being honest about it can actually help us check our behavior and behave in a less discriminatory way and move toward equity. And here's the example. It goes back to 1926, famous court case, actually, out of Detroit, Michigan. Most of you have probably not heard of it. They do study it in some law schools. It is a very famous criminal trial, but I didn't even hear about it until four or five years ago. It's a case involving a man by the name of Dr. Ossian Sweet, who was a well-respected physician of his time, African-American doctor, and his family and some of their friends, all of whom were brought up on murder charges. Here's what happens. Dr. Sweet buys a house in a previously all-white neighborhood of Detroit in 1925. Now, if you know anything about Detroit in the 20s, you know that the Klan ran the city of Detroit. A lot of people don't know that, but if they think of the Ku Klux Klan as a southern phenomenon, actually, Michigan and Indiana had the strongest Klans in the United States in the 20s. Detroit was run by the Klan so much so that they almost succeeded in getting a mayor elected in 1924. They just missed by a few percentage points. But they literally ran the place, and so the, and membership was huge. So so Dr. Sweet moves his black family into an all-white neighborhood. 
knows there's going to be trouble, but he says, by God, I can afford this house and I'm going to have this house. I'm not going to let them run me out, but he knows there's going to be trouble. So he gets his family together and he gets eight or nine of his family friends together. They come over on the night that they move into the house, knowing that there's going to be trouble. Sure enough, a mob assembles across the way, 700 strong, starts yelling slurs at the family. Eventually on the second night of the siege, they throw a brick or a rock through the upper window and break it. And at some point, a shot rings out from the house. We don't know who shot, but someone in, in the sweet home shoots a gun out in the direction of the mob. Two white people are hit. One is killed, one is injured. In spite of the fact this is obvious self-defense, they had every reason to think the mob was about to rush the house and burn them out. They're all brought up on murder charges, all of the suites and the eight members of their friendship circle who they brought over to help defend the home. So they're all brought, it's Dr. Sweet, it's his wife, it's his two brothers, and it's all these friends. Clarence Darrow, the most famous defense attorney probably in the history of the American bar, comes out of retirement to defend the Sweets and their friends. And the first trial, they, the, the, the state tries all of them at once in one big trial. And Clarence Darrow, as a defense attorney, goes at it with just the facts and he you know, argues self-defense and he argues we don't even know who shot the gun for sure and just sort of sticks with the facts of the case and he gets a mistrial. So he didn't lose, but he doesn't win. And the state decides we're gonna press on, we're gonna retry. We're gonna start with Henry Sweet, who's one of the brothers. And then we're going to see how that goes. They thought they had a stronger case against Henry. So they said, we're going to try him first, and then if we get the conviction there, we'll do the rest. So Darrow tries a different approach, because he, he wasn't satisfied with the hung jury, and he knows it's an all-white jury, all-male jury. He can intuit that they're probably not the most racially enlightened people in the country. This is an understatement of somewhat biblical proportions, right? It doesn't take a genius to know that they're probably not real racially liberal, but... Nonetheless, he gets up and he does something which is both brilliant and totally counterintuitive. First off, he gives a seven and a half hour closing statement. Now, that's counterintuitive. But, but, but you, gotta read, you can read the text of it actually online. There are no recordings to my knowledge, but there is a text, and it is the most stunning piece of legal oratory you will ever read. It is studied in law schools. It is so unbelievably brilliant. I mean, it's just incredible. The speakers just don't speak this way anymore. I mean, the language has been just weakened, I think, in that 80-year in that period uh, within the law. You know? but, so he gives this seven-and-a-half-hour closing statement, but that's not the really important thing. It's what he says in the very first paragraph, the very first few minutes, and he comes back to it like a dozen times. He gets up and he looks at his jury and he says, I say to you, you are prejudiced. And the word racist wasn't really around yet in the lexicon, but that's really what he's saying. He's saying, you're racist. I know it. You know it. He says, you don't like black people. You don't want them living next to you. You don't want them as members of your family. And you don't want them even coming into your house to eat. Don't lie. I was conditioned. You were conditioned. We were all trained to feel that way. And you know full well that if the tables were turned and this was a white family accused of killing black folks who were trying to run them out of the house, you'd be giving them medals of honor, not trying them for murder. And of course, this is totally counterintuitive. And it, you can imagine his, his other attorneys that are at the table with him. They're like, damn, shut up, man. You, you got a bunch of white men, and you're telling them they don't like black people. And your client, he's black. Like, stop. What in the world are you doing? Right? You, you're like priming them to act in a racist way. But he understood what he was doing, because the very next thing he did, whenever he would make this point that they were prejudiced against black folks, he would come back and say, and in spite of this, I expect you to do the right thing, and I know you will. Right? In other words, he made the point that they had a worse nature that often controlled them, but that wasn't all of who they were. They also had a better nature, and he was going to appeal to that. And it was brilliant, because what he just did, in case you hadn't figured it out, was he put them on notice. Right? He basically said, I'm telling you right now, if you do what I know you want to do to my man here, I know why you did it. And everybody in this courtroom is going to know why you did it. So I just got that out of the way. So I'll know that you did it because you don't like black people. So there you go. So, but you're going to do the right thing, right? So you can imagine, like in 26, that's, that, now even now, that would be a rare legal strategy. In 26, it's just like crazy. He does this for seven and a half hours. He leaves them with that. He's like, I know what the deal is with all of you. They go into recess. They deliberate for a couple hours. They come back full acquittal. The charges are dropped against all the other defendants. Right? The state realizes they will never win. Right? Now keep in mind what this means. You know, in 1926, yeah, there was that voice, the racist voice that was the dominant one for sure in white folks' minds in 1926. But even then, there was that little voice on the other side right, that said, I'm not supposed to think this way. Even then, now that voice might have been a whisper in 1926 for most white folks. I'm guessing it probably was. But it was there, and when you primed it, folks would move to do the right thing because you named it, because you called called it out because you put it on the table and refused to allow them to be manipulated by things subconsciously. If Clarence Darrow doesn't do that, I guarantee you his man goes down. Because at that point, they'll be able to content themselves with the idea they did nothing wrong. He's just guilty. 
they won't even realize they're being moved around the chessboard by their prejudices. But when you call it out and you say, be alert, be careful, or you could go down this road, the good person that's in most of us, even in the 20s, let alone in 2010, is like, I'm not supposed to go down that road, am I? Right? And there's a lot of research now which says when we name it, call it out, and put it right there in the middle of the room and have that conversation, that we can check our behavior. The attitude may still be there for a while. The belief system may not go away, but the behavior can change. And that's really what matters because the behavior is what determines une unequal outcomes and opportunity, not the attitude per se. We've got to check the behavior. And this is how I know it at a personal level. And I swear to God, I'm going to take these questions. Um, I thought I already understood this at the effective level. right? I've been doing the work for a long time. And then a couple years ago, something happened that drove it home to me even more blatantly. I was sitting around on a Sunday afternoon with my two girls and wife. And it's raining about 2 in the afternoon on a Sunday, uh, early part of the summer. Kids had just gotten out of school. At that time, it was actually three years ago, so they were almost six and almost four. And we're sitting around, nothing to do, can't go to the park, played every game in the house, right? And getting bored, the kids are getting restless. We decide, all right, we'll just watch a movie. Maybe that'll take us up to dinner time. We can feed these kids, get them to bed, you know, move on to tomorrow. Maybe the sun will come up. So we start flipping around channels on the Comcast on demand cable deal, right? So you pay $4.95, get a movie, that kind of thing. So we're flipping around and looking for movies that are good for families and kids. And we're not finding much, but we come across the trailer for the movie Evan Almighty, right? Which some of y'all probably saw. It's a story about, well, Steve Carell plays a congressman or a senator who's told by God who's played by Morgan Freeman, that a flood is coming. And so he should build a really large boat and ride it out. You have probably heard this story before in a different context, because this is really just a modern retelling of the Noah and the Ark story. And it's cute. You know, it's funny. Um, but as it turned out, the kids and my wife had already seen the movie when it was at the theaters like five or six months earlier. So they didn't really want to see it again. But because they recognized the characters and they recognized some of the dialogue from when they had gone to see it, it did get their attention in ways that the other trailers, the other commercials were not. So at one point, the little one, Rachel, who at that time is not quite four years old, looks up and she sees Morgan Freeman in the role of God, right, with the flowing white robes or whatever he's wearing. And she says what a four-year-old would say. She says, Daddy, is that really God? Because that's what you would do it for. You don't know anything about casting directors and the Screen Actors Guild, you know. You just think God didn't have anything better to do than to make a movie. So why not, you know? And I laughed. I thought it was funny, right? I laughed and I said, no, honey, that, that's, uh, that's just Morgan Freeman. He's just an actor. He, he plays God uh, often, but, <laughs> but you know, he, he's just an actor. Just an actor. You'll probably see him in this role again. He has a good agent. Um, but he, he's just an actor. And I thought that was the end of the conversation. I really did. But then the older of the two daughters, Ashton, who that time is not quite six, she looks up and she sees Morgan Freeman in the role of God. She looks at her sister. Now keep in mind, Ashton, because she's two years older, I've had more time to talk with her about issues of race just because chronologically she's been on the planet longer. So I've had more time. She looks up and sees Morgan Freeman, and she laughs, and she looks at her sister, and she says, Rachel, that can't be God. Now, I knew two things in this moment, as surely as I know my name. Number one, that I was going to have to ask her why not. And number two, that I already knew what her answer was going to be before I asked the question. But I had to ask it anyway. I looked over at my wife for some support. She's got nothing. <laughs> nothing. I look at her, she's got this look on her face, it's like, okay, smart ass, um, this would be your area of expertise. So good luck with that, I'm gonna go get the camera and uh, take some pictures and we're gonna scrapbook this precious moment. But I got nothing for you, chief, so good luck. So I know it's all on me, I look back at my, at my daughter and I ask her why not. Now in the split second, that I had to ask her why that can't be God before she answered. I had this like weird out of body thing. I thought I was dying, literally, it scared me to death. Thought I was dying, I'm like above the sofa, I'm like looking down, I'm having, I'm getting dizzy, I don't know, it's some out of body weird thing and I'm looking at the scene and I'm, and I'm, and I'm having this fantasy in this moment that my daughter is gonna have a brilliant answer. Not the one that I anticipate and that you already know I'm sure what it's gonna be but a brilliant alternative answer that I had not thought about, like, Daddy, that can't be God because God is a woman. <laughs> that would have made me very happy. Or even better, like some existentialist answer, like, Daddy, what is God anyway? <laughs> that would have been cool, but uh, like I said, she wasn't even six, so even though she's pretty bright, 
Not going to come up with that answer at that age. So I ask her, and all of a sudden she starts to move her mouth. The words start to come out. I'm zapped back into my body. The fantasy is over, and she says, that can't be God because God isn't black. God is white. Really? See, here's the thing, and I don't think it'll surprise you to learn. I don't have, in our home, we, we, we don't have any racialized images of a deity that would give one the impression that that deity, if that deity be in human form at all, somehow was the racialized equivalent of Santa in the clouds, right? Some white dude who gives out goodies or punishment from above, living in the sky. We don't have any of that imagery. We don't allow any of those children's Bible story picture books that you see when you're a kid. You know, the ones that give the impression, if you didn't know better, that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Sweden. We don't have any of that. <laughs> None of that. We don't allow any of that in the house. Never has it been in our home. But my kids are picking it up somewhere, right? They're seeing it. That imagery in libraries and in bookstores and in churches. And they're seeing it every Christmas when folks send us Christmas cards with pictures of Jesus on them that give you the impression that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Right? <laughs> so the images are affecting the mentality of our children, even in my home, right? which is explicitly an anti-racist home. Now, understand something. If you were to try to break into my house and hurt my kids, I'll kill you. And I'm not saying that to be all big and bad. I'm not a violent person, but I'm also not a pacifist when it comes to defending my family. I don't have a gun, but I'll find something. And I will throw it at you. And you will die. I mean, I'm just that confident about the velocity with which I will hit you between the eyes with whatever hard object I manage to grab. I'm just that sure of it. But do you understand, the point of me telling this story is something is coming into my house. And it is damaging my children. And the doors are locked, the windows are shut, the alarm is on, and this thing coming in does not know the code to turn it off. But it gets in and it gets out as quietly as it came before I even knew it was there. And it infuriates me. I'm not to blame for that, but I've got to be responsible for that. Because if I don't take responsibility for altering the mechanics of what that does to my child in an anti-racist home, and if we all, if that can happen in my home, it can happen in everyone in here's home. Not that I'm any better than anybody else as a parent, but I'm not any worse either. You know, at least I, at least I know that we've got to try, and yet even when I try, this stuff still happens. And if that happens to my child who's white, imagine what those images do to black and brown children who see the same images. Right? and get the impression of internalized inferiority, internalized distance from a creator, however you interpret that creator. See, this is why we got to understand this. This isn't about other people. This isn't about good people and bad people. It's about all of us internalizing this negativity, this poison, and needing to figure out how we're going to dispel it from our body, how we're going to expel it and get rid of it and distance ourselves from it. Because at this point, at this point, if we don't act as though our lives depend on this thing, we're going to discover in 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years hence that it's way too late. The risk is going to be greater. The cost is going to be higher. And the damage is going to be considerably more extensive. So thank you all so much for coming this evening. to the first part is absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty good, I talk pretty good, as we say in the South. Um, and I'm an okay writer. But there are a lot of folks of color who are every bit as good as speakers and every bit as good as writers. Every bit as capable to mix, you know, both anger and humor and all the stuff that I try to do that I feel I do pretty well. And they don't get nearly as much attention. 
So I know that, that, that my presence on the stage, not only literally this stage, but figuratively the larger stage of public attention is only partly about my talent. It's also about whiteness and it's about being male. Um, it also is because I got started when I was fairly young, so I was able to capitalize on that too. I was able to get out on the lecture circuit when I was 25, 26, when I was real close in age to the students, so that was like another selling point. There's like a lot of them, you know? And I, uh, so there's no question. The issue about whether I feel bad about it, I feel mindful of it. And the difference between being mindful of it and being feeling bad about it is that there isn't really anything that'll come positive out of feeling bad. It is what it is. As long as there's a system of racial privilege and gender privilege and inequality, anything I do in life, I will receive certain privilege in doing it. If I didn't do this and decided to open a restaurant or become a lawyer or anything else I could have done maybe and at one point thought I might do the lawyer thing, I would have had privilege in that. So it seems to me it's about determining what I'm gonna do with the privilege, not whether I'm gonna have it. Um, I'm going to have it until the system is fundamentally altered. So the only issue then is if I'm mindful enough about that to be accountable with it and to use it in a way that is accountable and use it in a way that has integrity. And that's a struggle and a challenge. I'm not going to say that I always do that right. Those of us who are white and do this work, whether it's in this generation or generations past as allies, have made tons of mistakes. I write about some of mine in my book, White Like Me, which is out there, my memoir. I talk about some of the huge mistakes I've made um, in the process of trying to do this work and the things I've learned from those mistakes. And I continue to make mistakes and continue to learn. But part of taking responsibility is being willing to do that and being willing to screw up and then get called on it by people of color and take the criticism and the feedback for what it is, which is a real gift. And so I don't feel bad about it, but I am mindful and I am cognizant of the fact that that happens. And every day I, I, I wake up and I try to do it better than I did the day before and the week before and the month before and the year before. And that means checking in with folks of color. Um, folks of color, a lot of folks of color look at my work before it gets published and give me feedback. White like me, I actually wrote two different versions of. And the first one, I hadn't really discussed this issue of accountability. And there were folks of color who called me out on it. And some white allies who said, you know, it's a good book, Tim, but you really should have had some stuff in here about this. And I said, you know, you're right. And I went back and I rewrote it. And I was lucky enough to have a publisher that would let me do that. But I went back and I said, I gotta change some stuff in a second edition. We need to add some things because I dropped the ball on some stuff. And so to me, that was like, okay, I've got this privilege. Now I gotta use it. To use it, I've gotta be able to listen to the criticism and to the feedback. And I try to do that. And sometimes I do it better than other times. But I think that's, that's part of it is, is being open to that. So yeah. Next Thank question. you. We have another question over here. Cool. Yeah, how you doing, Tim? Uh, Good. My name is Ron Whitaker, graduate student from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, my question is, how do we engage in this dialogue outside of the classroom? And I'm coming from the context of uh, specifically even talking to African Americans, because uh, from my, you know, from my uh, history, even African Americans do not want to engage in this in this conversation because they have the Lexus. <laughs> I think that there's a lot of reasons why folks don't want to engage. There, there are a number of reasons why white folks don't want to, and there are a number of reasons why folks of color don't, when they don't. For white folks, I think the reason, and understanding these reasons is important to figuring out how to break through it. For white folks, from what I have seen, both from the research and also just anecdotally my own experience, white folks shut down because we're deathly afraid that we're going to say something stupid that sounds racist and we're going to get called out. Like, oh my God, I'm going to say the wrong thing, and they're going to think I'm racist, and I'm really not, and blah, 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 blah. Right? That's one of the reasons. Another reason we shut down is because, frankly, there's a material stake that we have in maintaining things as they are. Now, we may not think about that consciously. I'm not saying that white folks walk around going, I'm going to keep my stuff and make more of it and, and lord it over people of color. I don't think there's that consciousness necessarily. There is for some people. But, you know, at some level, I think that most white Americans do know more about this than we let on. I think we do understand the extent of inequity because it's hard not to. Like, if you're a sentient sort of at all paying attention person, you can look around and see the disparity. So you have to maybe rationalize it to yourself. You might have to try to explain it away, but at some point you do see it. So I think there's an extent to which white folks shut down because they don't want to give up the advantage. And then there's the third reason why white shut down, which is once you acknowledge the problem, that, it, that it's a real thing in society, and you're a good person, now you're on the hook. See, if you were a sociopath, you wouldn't care. That's the good news. Most of us are not sociopaths. 
The bad news about us not being sociopaths is that good people have an especial psychological incentive to, to push badness away. I don't want to think about that because if I acknowledge there's an injustice and that I actually benefit from it, then I have to do something as a good person. And that is scary. James Baldwin talked about it as the fear of being turned away from the welcome table of white society. My family, my friends, people will turn their back, they won't get it, so I shut down. For people of color, the fears are different. Sometimes it is indeed that if they sort of made it at one level, they, they sort of have the ability to believe that they're past this issue. So for example, after the election, Will Smith now, and I know I'm talking about someone from the area, but still, Will Smith made the comment, right, that he made this comment on Oprah, that what he liked about Obama was that, and these are his words, not mine, now all our excuses are gone. Now that's heavy, right? When a person of color said, now all our excuses are gone, I think about, that, you know, that, 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 I mean, I guess when you make 20 mil of film, you know, it, it's easy to not really think about some stuff. I understand that, black, white, or otherwise, I get it, you know, but when you say excuses, it's almost like you're saying all that racism stuff was just stuff we said as an excuse to not work, which is horribly insulting, right, to the work that peoples of color have done, and I'm sure he didn't mean it to be insulting, but it just, it's that, you know, that, wow, when you have, and, and then for him not to even really think about how he got where he is. Now, he's a really good actor. He was a, he's a really good actor. I'm just going to say that, <laughs> right? And, and but, but now, why did he become big as a rapper? Why? Well, because he was safe for white folks. Because if he had come out when he came out, talking about the stuff that other folks were talking about at the same time, who couldn't even get airplay on MTV, who never won an MTV award for like the first seven or eight years, because I think he won all of them for like a bunch of years. It was always Will Smith, Will Smith. No offense to him, it's just to say, look, he was palatable to, to white folks. That made him a superstar. And so, in other words, he, and that's not to take away from whatever skills he has, it's just to say you wouldn't be the 20 mil of film guy if you had come out, yeah, I mean, you know, Ice Cube makes money in making movies too, but not 20 mil of film, right? He's not gonna be like the leading man and the hero in an action movie the way that Will Smith is gonna be, because even all those many years away from NWA, he's still Ice Cube, right? And so it's like, we cannot, because if someone shows the real of him, that is gonna be like, we're gonna see that Ice Cube, not that guy that's like out in the woods playing with his family movie or whatever that was. You know, so, so I just think we have to, and so some people of color don't want to talk about it because of that. Other folks of color don't want to talk about it because they know that if they do bring it up, that they might be shut down, retaliated against, to uh, assume that they're exaggerating. And that takes a psychological toll on people to have people basically go, yeah, whatever. I'm not listening to your life story. Wow, that's heavy. Other people of color don't want to talk about it because it scares the hell out of them. I mean, I've had conversations with, with black parents who are the parents of a kid in my kindergartner's kindergarten class and we were talking about, I was doing a training at the school and with the parents and with the teachers about how to talk about these issues with young kids and they were saying that they were afraid to talk to their children, that, that the little boy's like six or, or seven or whatever, I think he just turned seven. No, he's not, he's still six. And they were saying, you know, like we know we need to talk to him about these issues, but we're afraid that if we talk to him about things like discrimination and racism, um, that he's gonna get scared, which is a perfectly logical thing for a family of color to wonder about, like, am I gonna traumatize my kid telling them about what's happened historically and what still happens? And I said, you know, I understand that makes perfect sense. I can't really relate to that fear because it's different, right? But I absolutely understand as someone who's Jewish, I understand that, you know, to talk to little kids about the Holocaust, that's scary to, you know, the, the, I should say the Holocaust of European Jewry because there have been many. Uh, sometimes we take the term for ourselves and make it like we're the only ones, which is wrong. Um, but, but the Holocaust of European Jewry is one that I, it was scary to me when I first learned about it. But there are ways to have the conversation. And what I told these parents was we have to realize that to the young mind, the most important thing is not that they know what was done to their group. It's they need to know what their group did to fight back, to resist, to overcome. The resistance narrative, right, is more important than the victimization narrative. You gotta tell about the victimization. You can't gloss over it, right? Especially when little kindergarten kids were already doing MLK celebrations and stuff. So they gotta know he was fighting for something and they gotta sort of figure out what that was and you gotta tell them. But at some point, you also have to talk about not just King, but what did average everyday folks, whose names we might not remember, do to resist? Because then it takes that person of color from being the object of history, against whom stuff is done, 
to whom stuff is done and makes them a subject of their history where they get to make choices and they have agency and they did things. And that way I don't have to be disempowered. For a white kid, there's a parallel conversation, which is a way to avoid guilt because that's another thing that shut white folk down. White folks learn about, oh my God, I feel so terrible about what my people did. The only way we can, that doesn't help anybody. That never liberated anybody from oppression and never changed the system, right? Again, guilt versus responsibility. But what white folks do need to hear is that there have been white folks all through history. Not enough, sure. But there have always been white folks who stood up as allies in solidarity with people of color, going back to the colonies, going back to the conquest of indigenous land, to the, to the system of enslavement, to the theft of half of Mexico, to the internment of Japanese Americans, to the conquest and, the, and, the, and, and really the rape of the Philippines, which is what we did at the turn of the century. I mean, just the stuff that, that was done. There have always been white folks who said no. And if I'm a white kid, seven, eight years old, and I learn about the no, as opposed to just the silent okay, then I realize I have choices to make. So we just have to really reorient our own conversation. I think the way we're going to get break through that conversation is to talk about that resistance narrative, to talk about the ally narrative so that white folks don't get bogged down. They realize, okay, I've got role models I can follow that are different from the ones that I was given. Right? And we just have to be willing to go first. So if we're going to lead one of those dialogues or conversations, we have to be willing to put our stuff out there if we're going to have anybody else do it. Nobody wants to go first. That's why I try to go first and I try to get my stuff out there in my books and in my speeches. And then other folks, you can have your own conversations and I, hopefully it's a model for how you can do that. You don't have to be afraid. you know. Um, and like I told one of the other groups earlier, the irony of white and black folks and other people of color shutting down. White folks shut down, like I said, mostly because they're afraid of making a mistake and being thought of as racist. What's interesting is the research says that when white folks shut down and don't talk about race, even when it's obviously in the room, that's the very moment where people of color assume they are racist, right? So there's like an irony in that. White folks are like, oh, I don't want to seem racist, so I won't say anything. And black and brown folks are like, uh-huh, see, mm -hmm. that's why you're not saying anything. So it feeds the cycle, right? We have to be willing to take risk if we're going to break through that. Yes, next. There are about six people. Uh, okay. So far for questions. That's great. Uh, hello, Mr. Wise. My name is Mr. Nagby. I'm an undergrad here. You spoke a lot about the issues facing our society. I just want to know, what do you think are some of the solutions or steps we can take to reach that awareness that you speak of? Well, I will tell you a few things some of which I've alluded to. I mean, obviously, first, I think we have to take some personal inventory of where we're at on these issues and why, so that we can really check our own tendencies and our own scapegoating, stereotyping tendencies. That's white folks with regard to race. It's all folks with regard to gender, you know, particularly men, all men with regard to gender. It's, it's all people who have some money with regard to class. So we all need to take some inventory of our own internalized bias. Beyond that, I think we need to start right where we are. So here we are in an institution. I know some of you have come over from other institutions as well, but or you operate in multiple institutions, workplaces outside of this university, I think we need to take stock of the policies, the practices, and the procedures. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal, and determine which of those things um, furthers the goal of racial equity and inclusion and um, uh, yeah, equity, and which of those detract from it. You know, you have a, here at the school, you have a beautiful mission statement, very colorful, very, just like all college mission statements. It's beautiful, it's poetic, but are we really operationalizing that? Is there really a policy in place for example, to make sure that everything from recruitment and admission standards to hiring and tenuring and promotion standards to how curriculum gets chosen to what the uh, qualifications are for staff positions to the way that community service is done. I talked about this earlier in the first group I met with today. We have I know there's a lot of service learning and community service here. How, what's the mentality that folks take to that work? Is it a charity mindset or a solidarity mindset? Because see, the charity mindset says we're going to go help these poor people. The solidarity mindset is we're going to go work with these individuals to change the social systems that created the situation they're in. Right? There's a very fundamentally, and on most service learning and community service work, though it's very good and very nice, often is not viewed that way. It's viewed as a one-way street. We've got something, you need it, we're going to do it, and we're going to feel good about it. And we might even get a grade for it. That's what service learning does. We're going to go and it's going to be graded, but it's going to be graded by the professor. Not the people to whom the service was provided. That's crazy. Like if I provide a service in a community, they need to tell me if I did a good job. And if I didn't, they fail me. And if they say I did, then I get the A, right? But I mean, ultimately, it's like when I go down to build houses in New Orleans after Katrina, am I sitting there and learning from the elders in that community? Am I listening to the wisdom, the collected wisdom of the people who were there before I got there and who were going to be there after I leave about what they really need and what they're really about and what their community really needs most, both structurally and from us? That conversation sometimes doesn't happen. We need to have that conversation, especially at a campus like Villanova that I know takes very seriously this, this whole service concept, as do most religiously affiliated 
educated schools and even some, some secular schools that I go to are increasingly looking at it, but they're not necessarily looking at the, 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 the intentionality that they bring to the work. So that's one place to start. But ultimately, I'm reluctant to give you sort of a one through 10 for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't have a list like that. Um, number two, even if I did, you would be in no position to trust my list. Because the, really, because the truth is, you know your community better. You know what some of the local issues are. I mean, I know some of the stuff that goes on in Philadelphia, in the greater Philadelphia area, and I've written about it, and I've talked about it, and I know some of the stuff that goes on at this and every other school. But ultimately, I'm going to roll out of here tomorrow, and y'all are going to be here. And you're going to have to figure out long term after I'm gone, because if I, I might have a one through ten list, and if, it, if, if it's an awful list, and my advice is bad, I'm not going to suffer for it. I'll just be out, and y'all will deal with it. So this is the kind of stuff you have to figure out in community. Solutions are found in collective struggle. And so I think right now, and if you really you know, want to think about that, think this is a very important anniversary. This, this month and this whole spring is the 50th anniversary of the sit-in movements in the South. Okay, so February 1, 1960, four young men, North Carolina A&T, walk into that Woolworths in Greensboro, and they sit down on those stools. They refuse to move. Within weeks, the sit-in struggle is spread to Nashville, my hometown, where I live now, where I was raised, all throughout the South, and even some non-Southern towns. So you have this, and then within a few months, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is formed after Ella Baker, longtime freedom fighter, calls this group of young people. Ella Baker had been doing the work for, at that point, like 20 years, maybe longer, 30 years. And she basically says to herself and to all of her colleagues in the struggle, SCLC, NAACP, basically says, I don't trust all of us old heads who've been doing this work for three decades to get it right. Because we, we were out of ideas. We need some fresh blood. We need to get these young people in here and have them think about it. She has no reason to think that they know what they're doing. But she says, we got to get y'all. She calls a meeting in North Carolina. These students come. And from that grows one of the most important organizations in the history of the freedom struggle in this country, made up of young people, the average age of the people in this room, right? Sometimes younger, who get together. And they would get in church basements for eight hours with no air conditioning, right? And, and, and they, had nothing, they had none of the benefits of the internet to spread ideas and to spread counter narratives and to link up electronically, they had you know three networks and everything was slow and you know I mean it was just but they got together, they did the grassroots face-to-face -face stuff and they would go into those church basements. They didn't have a plan when they went in and Ella Baker didn't tell them what the plan was. And Dr. King and Abernathy and, and Shuttlesworth and 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 all these folks, they didn't come around and say, here's what you do. They said, y'all get in there and you figure it out and you 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 know smash heads together and these young people came up with these plans. So I think that especially now with this 50th anniversary of the student movement being so prevalent in our country, this is the perfect time for us to have the same confidence and the same faith in young people. And I have that faith. I'm not trying to compare myself to Ella Baker at all because I will never be one-tenth the freedom fighter that she was. But as an older person that's been in the struggle for a little while, I can look at it and say that I trust the young people in this room and even the young people that I meet that are like high school and middle school age to be able to sit down and say, okay, Here's the problem, so maybe I can serve as a diagnostician. I can come in and say, here's one way to look at the problem or to conceptualize it, but ultimately you can't trust the expert from the outside to give you the answer because there's too much at stake. It's one thing, if, you, if you're getting a surgery, you, know, you want the surgeon to know all the answers. You want the doctor to both diagnose and operate, although usually the diagnostician is not the surgeon. Correct? The diagnostician tells you what's wrong and then he turns it over or she turns it over to the surgeon and then he or she does the actual surgery. So we all have our own little areas of specialization. In this situation, unlike a medical situation, we all have got to be involved in coming up with these solutions. So a couple of those big picture items, looking at the way community service and service learning is done, looking at the policies, the practices, the procedures, and figuring out which ones further equity, which ones detract from them. The ones that further them, we strengthen. The ones that detract, we get rid of and replace with others. And that's the work that you all can begin to do right here at Villanova. Next question. Well, how are you? Um, my name is Sarah Clark. I am an undergraduate student here at Villanova University. Thank you, one. Um, and I had a question about, you say that we, like I just was listening to you, my question got rephrased a little bit. You say that we, you uh, think that we need to sit in rooms together and develop these ideas. However, my question to you is, you seem to be very open and have said that you've spoken to many black people or African American people, whatever you like to mm -hmm. say about issues of race. Um, how does one how did the how did you find those black people to talk to? How did you shape those conversations? Because right now I feel that um, there's many there's there are many conversations going on within yeah. like 
the black community at Villanova. Mm. However, it's really hard to like bridge the gap between that community and the white community. Yeah. To say that being a member of um, a mainstream sorority over here on campus and being right. very active in a lot of the other programs at Villanova and for me even, it's really difficult to right. speak to other members of the black community that are friends, roommates, whatever. Yeah. And, they, and we're all having the same problem where it's just like, we feel this way and we, we like feel yeah. that other people are like that. The, the rest of Villanova has another feeling towards this, and we want to bridge the gap and we want to talk. Yeah. But there's that initial <clears throat> that makes it really difficult. Well, I think that ultimately the only way that this or any other school bridges that gap is you have to start from scratch and the ground up whenever the new academic year begins by sending a very clear signal at the outset that part of the gig, so to speak, of coming here and part of the gig of going through this institution and graduating and getting a degree and all that stuff, and really part of the gig of working here too for people who are here in a professional capacity is dealing with these issues. It's not the only thing that you're gonna do while you're here. You're here to get an education on a lot of different things, whatever subject you decide to focus on. Professors are here to both teach and to do research and do all kinds of other stuff, but, but I think that unless the school sends a very clear message, which it can do at the beginning of every year if it chooses to, and if the pressure is put on them to do so, to say, you know what, this is something we expect everyone to engage in, and we're gonna create the opportunities to make that happen. We're not gonna expect you to just get together on your own and do it. We're gonna create the opportunities for that. We're gonna start with that in the orientation process, just like we have orientation about a lot of things. I remember when I started college, we had orientation about all kinds of subjects. How to deal with your financial aid, how to deal with your schedule, not to drink too much, what to do when you go out. Uh, we even had like a date rape orientation, uh, which is good, a very important one to talk about sexual assault and those kinds of things. Um, we didn't talk about this stuff at all, right? It was almost like, well, we gotta orient you for all this other stuff, but this will just leave hanging. And then of course stuff would happen and we would have these absurd conflicts. And right now you see that all over the country where when schools don't deal with this as a first principle issue and really say, look, we're not saying everybody has to agree on everything. We can have spirited discussion and debate and dissension around all kinds of things, but we have to at least be, understand that this is going to be part of the process, is having a conversation about racial equity, about diversity, about multiculturalism, about discrimination, about privilege, about all of these concepts, and we're gonna have these, and we're gonna structure some opportunities for that conversation. Some schools have done it with mandatory classes that people have to deal with on these issues are coming in. Other schools have done it where they've worked with departments to not necessarily mandate things, but to work with them to help them weave through their departmental curriculum courses that speak to this stuff which can be interdisciplinary and work with other departments. There are a lot of approaches and none of them are perfect but I think that the school has got to and really the school should send this message before orientation. The school really needs to be sending this message when it's recruiting and when high school students are looking at the school. Like it's important to make sure that if I'm a high school student thinking about coming to Villanova that I know like okay part of coming there is going to be I got to be willing to sit down and really grapple with this and if if I'm not comfortable with that, or I don't think I can handle that, or I'm not ready for that, or I just don't value that, then maybe I don't come to Villanova, right? Maybe I've got really good test scores and grades and I'm really qualified academically, but maybe it's not the place for me. And if we start to do that as a school, make this something that is central to the operation of the institution, over time we grow a cadre of students, we grow a cadre of staff, we grow a cadre of faculty and administrators, all of whom understand that part of the price of the ticket, so to speak, is that we're gonna confront these issues. We're not always gonna do it easy, but we're going to do it. And I think that that's, that's number one. Number two is that we have to, to realize that there are two things going on. There's the inter-group conversation, which I'm saying we need to have. But there's also the intra-group conversation that you're describing that people of color are already having and that that's important too. I mean, the reality is I want everybody to be able to have this conversation with each other, but sometimes in order for us to do that, Folks of color have to get clear on their stuff and what they're experiencing before they're gonna be willing to sit down and have that conversation with white folks. I, I, if I were a person of color, I would feel that way. I would feel like I'm no way am I gonna go put my stuff in the street in front of white folks if they're not gonna have to do the same thing. And I know they haven't even thought about it for a week. So I'm not doing it, you know, I'm not, we're not doing it. So we're gonna have some of this is gonna be in the family conversation, but there is value in that. 
Don't ever, don't ever dismiss the value of it because what the evidence says is that having that intra-group time, whether that's organizational time or just getting together and just, and just hanging out as people of color, and I know sometimes it makes white folks nervous, you know, they see black and brown folks hanging out, like what's going on? What are they, what's all that about? You know, what are they, what are they plotting? Um, are they talking about us? You know what I mean? And, and, and really they're not, you know, Nine, 99 times out of 100, we're not the subject, but, um, but the thing is, that's important because it allows people to get a sense of normalcy. All I want to do is have a parallel conversation. I want white folks to have these conversations when we're just around other white folks. See, and we really don't do that, but white folks need to have conversations about allyship. White folks have to have conversations about what am I going to do to be in solidarity with people of color? I think men should do this. I've seen a lot of this on campus around the country where men are getting together and forming like men against sexism groups or men against violence against women groups or whatever. These are groups that are made up of men, and the whole point is as men to stand up against sexist mistreatment of women. Now, are women willing to, are open to come to those meetings? Yeah, but most women are like, cool, y'all do what you need to do. We're going to check in with you because we want to make sure you're not going off the rails and doing something crazy. But, but for the most part, we're glad that you are doing this as men. And I think white folks could be doing a similar parallel conversation. My guess is if white folks start to have that conversation and people of color continue to have the one they're already having, then we can get some of the nonsense out of the way early. And that'll make it easier to come together. We'll be able to have a, an interracial conversation better once we've had some of the intra. I'm not saying we do one. It's not that it's, it's, it's uh, one after the other. It needs to be concurrent. But, but sometimes you have to put more focus, at least at first, on the intra-group stuff. But make it clear that the purpose of this, the goal, the mission of that, is to get us to a place where we can sit down and just be honest and deal with all the BS that we got to deal with you know, without, without acrimony and without recrimination and fear. So um, I mean, there's no formula. You know, There's no formula. You just keep at it, and you keep trying it, and you keep creating opportunities for people. And you know full well that a lot of folks will never engage in that conversation. OK. But the school needs to be pressured to make that understood that that's going to be a requirement, that that's going to be part of it. And if you send that message early and often enough, I think over time you, you will see, or can see, at least some cultural change in the institution. Could, could I just do a quick check before we do the next question? We have about, uh, I'd say about five, six or so minutes left. Could I just see the hands of people who had wanted to ask questions? Okay. I'll take several more. It's OK. I don't mind. OK. Dr. Nance, you're the. Uh, Tim, yeah. our, our speaker has been speaking, has been okay. with us for the full day, and we want to be mindful uh, that uh, he leaves Villanova with a good impression and uh, not on a uh, part. So, no, I'm good. if we could, if we could take, if we could be true and uh, go till nine o'clock, so okay. we can take maybe two more okay. questions. And typically, you know. That'd be fine. And, and let me just say for those, and again, it's my fault that we're not getting to them all because I speak too damn long when I do my answers. But uh, if you have questions that are burning questions that you want to ask me after, please know that I'm perfectly fine with you emailing me and asking me this. It doesn't mean I'll get back to you right away. I will try. Um, but if, my website is timwise.org. You can go there. There's an email button on there. Um, you can send me a message on Facebook. You can do all kinds of ways to reach me, and I'll be happy to try to, to get back uh, to you on whatever question you have if you don't, we don't get to it right now. Okay. So, yeah. Hey. Right. <laughs> yeah. You need another one? Thank you. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that tired. I'm close, but I'm good. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to say thank you for the presentation. Honestly, I felt really moved by it. Cool, thank you. Is it on now? Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, yeah, now, now, now it's on. Now that you said how moved you were, and you know, no. he said he was moved, just in case he didn't hear. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I was moved. I felt charged up after the awesome. great. lecture. Great. My problem is that I graduated from here last May. I traveled for six months now. I'm back home yeah. in suburbia, New Jersey. Yeah. Where, like you said, it's very easy to forget these problems, these issues, especially in my neighborhood. Yeah. It's predominantly white. And, um, you know, my question is, how do I break through? Like, do you have any practical advice? Because, yeah. you know, it's it's not so much that people are mean, like you said. It's more that yeah. apathy is the biggest problem to me. And right. how do you get people to care who don't have to care? It's well, in a small household level. Almost. I think um, what we have to do is, number one, wherever we are, we need to, to, to do a little digging around and investigating to find out who are some of the folks in the general community, either directly or close by, 
who are already working on some of these issues, because I don't know of a single community anywhere where there aren't such people. I mean, they're there, whether it's the handful of people of color who live in an area or even some white allies. It might be church groups and synagogue groups, mosque groups. It might be youth organizations. I mean, there's somebody doing something. So number one is to find out who those people are and figure out, okay, how can I connect to their efforts? How can I be part of their efforts and really help this conversation move forward? Because I guarantee you, they're probably looking for you as much as you'd be looking for them, and they need folks to really be part of that conversation. That's number one. Number two, I think, is um, that, that we have to recognize that all the institutions that exist in our community, whether it's the schools our kids attend, if we have kids, whether it's the place where we work, whether it's the neighborhood where we live, that there are going to be opportunities for us to jump into this conversation or to help further this conversation in the schools, even if our kids don't go to the schools. If we live in a community, we have a stake in the schools and what they're doing and what they're not doing. We have an interest in what's going on in that school system, even if we don't have a kid in it because we don't have kids yet or our kids go to a different school somewhere else or our kids graduated and we're older. Um, so getting into that conversation, going to school board meetings and really raising these issues about you know how are we dealing with issues of race and ethnicity in our classroom, both in terms of the curriculum plus what's going on in terms of discipline. Is the discipline handed out fairly? Because we know the studies say it's not. Is the tracking being done in a way that's racially disparate? We know the studies say that it probably is. Um, what's going on in terms of housing opportunity? There are usually organizations, particularly in some of the suburban areas that are mostly white, who are regularly doing like testing, right, doing auditing of housing opportunities so they have people that go out and test and try to find out. They might have a white person and a black person or a white person and an Asian or Latino person go out and look for an apartment or look for a house. You could get involved in some of those efforts and they, they, they train them you know, to, to look similar and speak similar and have similar background characteristics and then go out and test and see if there's unequal treatment. So there's just a whole lot of little roles like that. Or you, know, you can start to really explore and examine the media in your community. What are some of the images that are, that are being distributed on the local news, particularly because the evidence from the, from the study says that local newscasts, particularly broadcast, are the worst at, at, at sort of distributing racialized images that are negative. So you could be looking at that, exploring that. You could blog about that. You could, you could contact the media, get people together about that, especially young people who I have found really have a lot of media savvy about looking and seeing some of these images and what's going on. You could do cultural audits in your community and, 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 and report on your findings to the press or blog about them. Um, right now, that's the good thing about blogging. I mean, yeah, people can blog and like just have crazy stuff in there, but you also have the opportunity to really share some counter knowledge and 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 some you know some 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 stuff that people haven't thought of. And when I was teaching at Smith briefly in the School of Social Work, just as an adjunct in the summer of 05, what we had our students do was I was the white professor, there was a professor of color. We teamed up in all these different sections. There were teams, and we had our students go out in Northampton, Mass, which to white folks is like progressive nirvana, right? It's it, I mean it really white folks think it's like the place, and and people of color not so much. Like they, there are things about it they like, but they're also like, wow, this is really not so cool for the rest of us because it's really white, even though it's progressive. So we had our students go out and look around and explore the cultural, what was there, what wasn't, what products are available in the stores, what products aren't, what, what, are, the, what are the Hallmark cards have and who do they not have represented, things like that. What magazines can you find and what magazines can you not find? Are there hair care products and things for black women as opposed to just white women? I mean, things that the white folks had never thought about and sometimes you'd find stuff, but yeah, not in really good supply or you'd find just all these cultural indicators that would make white folks maybe feel comfortable, but the people of color would go, hmm, I don't know about this. So they're just all those different options, but I think finding some like-minded people, uh, whether they're of color, whether they're white allies, maybe in the religious community, maybe in um, the school community, maybe in some activist organizations, a place to start. Yeah. This is the last question for the evening. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you. Um, I've been working in human rights around race and racism most of my life. Since I was a teen. And what I really haven't heard about tonight is all the institutional racism practiced in this country, whether it be the criminal justice system, where we incarcerate an overwhelming number of men of color, or it's our drug disparity uh, laws, or um, other areas like this. Um, I heard a report recently that said we've increased hate groups the last 18 months right. by 300 from 400 that were counted just a few years ago. Right. So um, the dialogue, I think, is vital. But what I don't hear us talking about is all the 
So if you would accept the whole ways we have practiced racism and right. continue to support in this country with our laws and our practice. Right. I just want to Absolutely. Well I was hoping that, that would be the that would be what folks knew I was getting at when I talked about the racial profiling and the and the job discrimination and the housing discrimination stuff that obviously I I meant by that institutional practices, but I, I could have been clearer on it, I'm sure. Um, there's so much more to it, obviously. I mean, there's the, the whole criminal justice piece. I talked about only the sort of profiling piece and law enforcement at the top end. The, the bigger end is, for instance, that, and we really ought to make sure we know this, 1964, which was four years before I was born, um, two out of three people locked up in this country, jail or prison, local, state, federal, were white. One third were people of color, mostly black, some Latina. By 1994, so 30 years later, and still today, about two thirds are people of color, one third are white. Now, there are only two possible explanations. Number one, around 1965, white folks woke up from a deep criminal slumber and said, we're done, no more crime. We're gonna shape up and fly right, as my mama used to say. And then black folks heard the news and said, well now, hell, if y'all aren't gonna do the crime, we'll go do it because somebody's gotta do it. That would explain it. Like White folks got our stuff together, people of color went crazy. Of course, that's not the explanation. The other explanation is the accurate one, which is that the percentage of crime done by whites and people of color didn't really change all that much in that 30 year period. The Latino share went up because the Latino population went up, but you know, not enough to explain that shift two to one to two to one or two to one to one to two, as it turned out. Um, what it was was a concentration of resources in certain communities and not others. So according to the data, white folks are about 70% of all the drug users in the country. Non-Hispanic whites, that being the term the census gives us, 70% of all the drug users, which is actually more than our share of the population, which is 67%. So we're actually a little disproportionately likely to use. But we're only about 10% of the people incarcerated in a given year for a drug possession offense. Blacks and Latinos combined are 23 to 25 percent of the users. They are about 90 percent of the people locked up in a given year on a drug possession offense. Um, so something's going on, and it isn't about drugs, and it isn't about safety. It's a mechanism of social control. And I will leave it to your imagination, all of you, to figure out why after 1964 the society needed new mechanisms of social control. I think we know the answer. I'm not implying conspiratorial stuff here. This is sociological functionalist theory is what this is. Functionalist, functionalist theory says that systems stay in place because they work for certain people. And indeed they do. The system works for those at the top, those who have power, so there's no need to change it. When the Rockefeller drug laws first came in, those first few years they were catching a lot of white kids in, the, in Greenwich Village who were getting high, and a lot of the parents who had power were like, this isn't what we meant. All right? When we said crack down on drugs, we didn't mean our children who were just smoking a little weed. You know, that's not what we mean. So then they changed the focus of the law. But the law stayed because then it became functional for, you know, or similar law stayed because they became functional. They worked for people. It's why we keep the SAT, the ACT, the GRE, the MCAT, the LSAT. Every administrator at a college knows that these are not good indicators of ability. They know that. They weren't even crafted to be. These tests were only intended to tell us about the very next year of school. So the SAT at best can predict your freshman grade. It was never intended to predict anything else, and yet we have schools that use that as a primary selection criteria. Law schools know that the LSAT has no correlation to future legal success. It doesn't even have a correlation with law school graduation that's significant. It has no correlation with th three-year grades. It has correlation with the first-year grades after you've taken the test, and even then it's pretty weak. It's a pretty weak correlation. GRE doesn't tell you anything about anything. It's an absolutely pathetic test. Absolutely pathetic. The average correlation between the GRE score and your, and your grades, your first year of grad school, is 9%. Right? I mean, it's just absolutely abysmal, right? Um, so in any event, the, but why do we use them? It's institutional racism. It's not over bigotry. It's institutional because it works for certain people. The people who benefited, the people who were the dominant group, it works for them. They had the best opportunity, so they're going to do best on the test. So is it, is it bigotry? No. Is it overt hatred? No. But it is a form of institutional inequity. The old boys network and jobs, same thing. Most jobs, white collar or blue collar, interestingly, are filled through networking and word of mouth. So that, uh, and this is something to think about when we have a stimulus bill. And I write about this in my newest book that will be out in three weeks, which is a critique of colorblindness both at the level of public policy and at the level of private practice. One of the things about the stimulus bill that was horribly flawed was that there was no intentionality about making sure that any of that money 
was going to end up in the pockets of businesses owned by people of color. Not even an attempt. I realize the courts have limited how blatant and explicit you can be, but I mean, there was nothing. And so what happened is we throw a lot of money at construction companies to do infrastructure work, which is, I know it's important and you got to get the money out there and stimulate the economy, but the construction industry is one of the worst records on race and gender equity of any industry in America. So when you throw billions of dollars at the construction firms that are a bunch of white guys, mostly, even if they're not bigots, they're not, women are not in their networks and people of color, male or female, are not in their networks. So less than one and a half percent of the stimulus money ended up going to companies owned by people of color. It's a record that is every bit as bad, if not worse, than prior administrations. Now, I'm not one who says that Obama has to do more for people of color, but he surely shouldn't be allowed to do less. Right than, than, than white presidents have done, and that's the, so we have to really understand some of the institutional inequity happens because we're just not paying attention. It's not even because we're deliberately hurting people. It's just we take our eyes off the ball. We just don't even get the way that this thing or that thing, this policy or that policy has this or that effect. And I think that's why we have to be profoundly color conscious about our institutional space. Teachers have got to be color conscious about how they teach. If I'm a teacher and I don't realize the effect of color and, and the consequences of color, as Julian Bond says, on the students of color in my class, I'm not going to serve their needs because I'm going to treat them just like they're white folks, which means I'm treating them like they're not having that challenge. If I treat women and girls the same as the way I would treat boys and men, I'm ignoring that they're dealing with sexism, right? I have to, like as a parent, I think about that all the time with my kids because ultimately, what kind of father would I be if I didn't tell my girls, you know, there are men and boys out there who think that you are less than and they are wrong and here's how you will prove them wrong. I gotta, but I gotta tell them. I can't just say, honey, you can be anything you want to be. Because then if I don't prepare them for the obstacles that are down the road in the fog that they don't even know where they're, they're going to run the hell into that wall and then they're going to be on their butt and they're going to go, wow, why didn't you tell me about this? Maybe if I'd known, I could have figured out a strategy. But you didn't tell me because you were trying to protect me. So it's really about trying to, to prepare folks for the hurdles that are in their way and that are institutional and individual and sometimes both. And uh, generally, we haven't done a very good job of that. So I hope that we can begin to have a conversation and not be afraid of it. And I think that the thing we've done is we've, we, we, we're all so sort of wrapped up, all of us to some extent wrapped up in this post-racial narrative. But we just have to realize, look, odds are the president is not going to lead this conversation for reasons of his own. So he may think those reasons are valid. He may think it's too high a risk for him. The research that I've done for this new book suggests to me that he could do a lot more. He could say more than he thinks he can. And in fact, that there may be some benefit to him saying some things. But regardless of what he's going to do, it doesn't matter whether you agree with that or not. He's not going to do it in all likelihood, so we have to do it. We cannot wait for the president or the Congress or any senator or any lawmaker of any kind to, or any media mogul of any kind, media personality, to actually take this issue up. We have to do it, just like those young people did 50 years ago. They didn't wait. Uh, they knew they were doing it with no support. I mean, they had a much more hostile environment to raise those conversations than, than we have. And they had to ex exemplify a lot more courage in order to do it, and they did it. So we just have to take that same sort of approach, I think, and, and recognize that, that in every one of our institutions, our schools, our health care, there's a whole conversation in my new book about health care and how we totally have finessed racial inequity in health care as an institutional force. We, we've looked at health care as just an issue of affordability and access, when in fact the racial disparities are not mostly about that. The racial disparities, according to the evidence, are mostly about disparate treatment by physicians, which is not deliberate and intentional, not based on bigotry, but based on the fact that doctors have internalized biases, just like everybody else, and the cumulative stress of dealing with discrimination, which has an effect on the black and brown body. So that people of color, even who have insurance, good jobs, high occupational status, and, 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 and good coverage, are nonetheless experiencing bottle so much additional stress that it is shortening their lifespan, that it is affecting them, that it is re resulting in higher blood pressure, that it is resulting in, in higher release of stress hormones and cortisol and things that, that have a direct influence on everything from early um, uh, infant, uh, infant mortality to preterm labor. I mean, all these things. That, and a hundred studies in the last decade demonstrate that racism itself is having the effect on some of that. But we haven't had that conversation. So here we've got health care reform, quote, or health, health insurance reform, quote unquote, that A, it isn't really unique universal, even as much as I think it's, it's better than nothing, but horribly flawed and weak, and B, it does nothing about the racial disparity. We're going to have to push that now because that is not even in the frame. Like that conversation just wasn't even had, so we're going to have to bring it full circle and have that about all these different institutional structures, and I hope that we'll do that as we go forward and push politicians in both parts act, and then we'll respond. Right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.